I'm not. Appears to be working. That is useful. Right then. Hello everyone. Let's see, who's got here? Um, since I first started. Oh, Paul and Brock Payne were here first. Then we have Tis Francis Fault. So, hi to Paul, hi to Brock, hi Tis Francis Fault, hi Golden Eagle. Hi Vision, hi Stephanie, hi Strub, hi Night Iron Productions, hi Daniel, hi Blue Shirt Buddha, hi Albert, hi Jay Richardson, hi Tis Francis Fault, I think I said that one, hi Strub, hi Paul Johnson, hi Stephanie, hi Martin Darity, hi Stafford, hi Greg, hi Jay, hi Carl, hello Gordon. Hello everyone, right now first or first, brew ships. I need some brew. Don't worry. Before you worry, this is a very nice gift I received from my lovely girlfriend and her family. So thank you very much to the sponsors of today's brew ships, Louise Ann and Eric, because they supplied the iron brew. But also just because these, I don't want to drink through all these, all their lovely bottles. They sent in one to go. Um, I've also got some of the bottles which came from the carp, courtesy of the very nice people who donated in, in super chat. So thank you very much. Between Super Chats and Co-op and my lovely girlfriend and her family and Amazon, we have got the Iron Brew for today's brew ships. The important supplies. Hello, Nectasia. Two minutes past six and still no Dr. Clark. Iron Brew. It wasn't so much the Iron Brew supply that was running low, but if you hear any weird loud noises... Uh, my sister has picked Sunday afternoon to clear and clean the kitchen. And so I went down and hefted the table out the way. And while I was hefting the table, because she waited to do it till about five o'clock today, and suddenly decided she wanted to do it, meant that I, I went hefted the table and then realized it was a, literally two minutes to six. So um, that's what caused the direction today, me being used for my muscle, basically. Close, but it won't go anywhere. <coughs> right. So, how are we all doing today? As this is all working, I'm going to make this a little smaller, so I can just check that the camera is working still, and this, these questions are a little bit bigger, so I can see the text a little bit easier. Hello everyone, right then, let's see. Did it did. Jay Richardson, I'm very glad to see there's an apology going on. It you know, I always like to see it when people as you know, I do it myself. If I make a mistake and I go and find research upon I was wrong, I do apologize. I love to see when other people do it. I consider that not enough people do it these days apologize and admit when they're wrong. I think the world will be a whole lot better if more people did. So very good on you, sir, for admitting and for doing it, for doing the research and for admitting it. Um, the amount of people who tend to just migrate to their positions and never acknowledge they were wrong in the first place, I find absolutely absurd. <sighs> right. Evening, Potter. <laughs> I'm sitting here with a bottle, a lovely bottle of the brew, thanks to my parents. That's very good parents. Um, blue Shirt Butter, how is the fluffy research assistant doing? Currently hiding from the mop with my mum. <laughs> the kitchen floor. There are two things in this world. He, well, three things in this world he doesn't like. Uh, thunder and lightning. The Hoover. And the mop. <laughs> um, you know, hey, hey. <laughs> Jerison, best way to clean the shit? A steam cleaner and water pressure washer. Providing your kitchen is built sturdy. Don't think it's that sturdy. Uh, did it. This is I'm trying to smoke smoking. It's making very tired. It's worth it, though, in the end. Although this is coming from someone who was basically told by a doctor when he was younger that all his, both his mother and sister had asthma, his, his great-aunt had had lung cancer, his grandfather had emphysemia, 
and two other members in my family had various lung conditions. And he basically went, Alex, you don't have any lung conditions, but considering your family history, smoking for you is even more of a suicide risk than pretty much anyone anyone else I've ever met. So don't do it. And I listened to him. I do swimming, running, and rugby instead. Which is why, with shielding and COVID-19 and me doing this the whole time and sitting in here all the time, I developed the podge. And the sit-down bike is supposed to arrive this week. Hasn't arrived yet. Ah, well, not sit-down bike, the indoor bike. I don't know. Oh, I'll get there, I'll get there. But at least I have plenty of books to read. Hmm. Sean, Matt, my new laptop is here, so got here. So if I ban you, I meant to do it. <laughs> That's good, Sean. <laughs> I actually thank you again to the um, admins who are on today. We have Daniel Freeman, Sean Mac, and I think I've seen Brock and uh, Paul on here as well. So thank you to all of you. It's very useful having the admins because it means I can just concentrate on answering questions instead of worrying about admin. Hmm. Golden Eagle, same sister works in Kingston. Yes, she's a civil engineer. She works out the precise things of doing everything. She's very good. <laughs> Jerishan, Dr. Clark, is the mop like looking in the mirror for Raleigh? We don't go there. That's being a bit cruel to the pool. Next to Asia, watch your video on the tribals and the Bismarck chase and was glad to see someone else who is willing to say that the destroyers did achieve this during the night. It hits during the night. Yes, they did. And as I would point out, and this is the great thing, me and Drac both agree on this one and Jamie does as well. We're often talking with us and and I think he probably did beforehand, but you know, hadn't but I was with. the thing is the ship is so big that the crews in various spaces, your experience of a fight if you're in one of the forward spaces of the ship is very different than if you're in one of the aft spaces of ships. If you're in one of the exposed gun positions or if you're in one of the main turrets, if you're in the conning tower, you know, all these spaces are very different experiences. And you have to get a lot of experiences to get an idea of what a fight's like and what's gone on. Dan Freeman, Dr. Carl Dr. has done his weekly once per video reminder to you, Adriatic. I hope it means something, although it may be some sort of spycraft word, I suppose. It means that he wants me to do the Adriatic in World War One. There are some lots of battles went on there, and I have promised him that at some point I will do World War One, and I will look at the Adri the fights in the Adriatic because I'm as interested as he is. I just haven't had time to put him in, but I'm going to. So today's books, there are a lot of them. There are sixteen of them next week. Now, I will say this, okay? Um, free books due to uh, arrive from Amazon this last week haven't arrived yet. So I changed, added some additions in. So some of the books, the theme is theoretically new to me, but some of these books aren't new as new to me as the others are. Um, they've been substituted in because they're still good books. And some... Well, uh, some are, of course, new. And also, I have to admit, there is one book which I will tackle first because it's kind of special. I started doing these as book reviews on a Sunday only a few weeks ago. And this has turned up this week. Um, it was sent to me to review for the channel. And they thought I would rather enjoy it. Um, I'm not sure if it was actually sent to me by the publishers or the actual author it was sent to me by someone they basically someone felt i'd enjoy and enjoy reviewing it and because it's all about the china state royal navy's china station and i have really enjoyed reading it and i'm going to give it a wonderful review but i'm not sure what who sent it to me because it didn't come with the normal pack i would get when i'm sent a book to review through one of the journals so i don't know if that's because the journals add in those packs and this was just sent to me by a publisher or if it just was sent to me by someone else who just thought this is a really cool book and I would like to review it. But it is a really, really great book, and I will get it a bit closer and away from my mic 
so you all can see it. The Royal Navy and the China Station, 1864 to 1941. And can I tell you why this is such a cool book? It tells the entire history of the China Station through its commanding officers. It tells you their stories. It tells you their experiences, their life stories, how they came. And their reports, their details. It's just amazing. It's got everything referenced. It's got some beautiful pictures. Let me just find someone. He says it's got beautiful pictures and then hasn't. There you go. It's got beautiful pictures in it. It is an absolutely beautifully bound book with maps. Sorry, you can't see that. There you go. Um, it is gorgeous. It is £25 on Amazon. So it's probably expensive some places in the world. But it's just beautiful. And it goes for all the animals. There are some things in it which I find a little bit... Mm -hmm. uh, there's the fact that I know for a fact that in the later officers, especially towards the in the 1920s, 1930s, an officer might be appointed as a vice admiral, but they were quickly promoted admiral once on station um, for their rules. But it lists them as vice admirals, and it uh, there are certain things in there. But it is still absolutely excellent. Mm. So, this book. Really, really cool. And... Well, i just give you this. Um, what I found interesting out here was in... Appointed a vice admiral in 1519, appointed CNC China of effect from 24 July 1919, and at Chatham on that day, 900 hours, his flag at first was hoisted in the cruiser Hawkins, 9,750 tons, Captain Reginald G. H. Henderson. In due course, in June 1921, Reginald Henderson was succeeded in command of the ship by the CNC's son in law, Captain William James. R. G. H. Henderson. And it has all the details. And it has the logbook of the Hawkins. So, it, you know, it was... Basically, I'd submitted... I've already submitted my book, so I can't go in and add that little taster in there. But it's kind of cool. I already mentioned this far East service, but... This is the... <sighs> If you're interested in the day-to-day -day running and the strategy and the people behind making decisions in the Royal Navy's China Station for a period which is damn near 80 years, this is an absolutely amazing book. And it is full of all the referencing, all the academics, and it, it gives you pictures of as many of them as it can find pictures. It gives you all their details. It discusses them. It tells you what they're thinking. Even has stuff about Ernest King. The plain smoking Admiral King did not hide his irritation at some of the tactics of our British ally and Admiral Sir Percy Noel had complained to me personally in conflict that he was not getting courteous cooperation from the Admiral, American Admiral. I got King in a corner soon after he passed on per soon after, passed on Sir Percy's complaint and asked him to be more polite. King did quiet down for at least fifty uh, for a while at least. That was by Admiral Leary, who actually had to act as mediator between the two. And remember, Noble is remembered as one of those admirals who was actually very diplomatic. So that's how much fun he was having with him. He also had, of course, a me a many meetings with Admiral Yamamoto Isokoro, Isokoro. And um, there, he's in there. And it's just, oh, it's just a gorgeous book. It really is. The various officers I meet the pictures. This is a absolutely wonderful book. It's described in the back. In the 19 Navy list from 1864, April 19, the China Station was first shown as a separate Royal Navy station. It remained as such until the out outbreak of the Pacific War in December 1941, which was to signal the end of the era. And at that point, it becomes the Far East Fleet. And it's combined, and then it becomes British Pacific Fleet and various other things. But this is the history of the China Station. This is the history 
of the Royal Navy in the Pacific, in China, in the Yangtze, all these areas. It is beautiful. Uh, Chibana, that book is so large, I think it might weigh 25 pounds. Possibly. There we go. I was amazed how heterogeneous the China Squadron was in 1904 to 1906. Many different designs serving to her. Yes. Ben Freeman, 500 pages, a proper transfer squadron. Yeah, it will be. This is. And those are good quality pages. It's a, also it's a big book. Um, you've seen it. It's as big as my head. It is. It is as big as my head. It's a beautiful book, though. I really have enjoyed it. I've had it for about a week. And it's been fantastic and fun to read. Hi, King George V. Um, let's see. Second one, only £25. I was expecting more. <sighs> yeah. Interesting, the hardback edition is much cheaper than the payback. Probably because due to its size, the hardback edition is probably actually easier to bind than the paperback. This is one of the dirty little secrets. Paperback is often considered the cheaper one, but actually it can be more expensive because of the binding when you've got a book over a certain size. And considering the pictures and the size difference between the hardback and the paperback, I would go for the hardback. I really would. Oof. It is lovely. And it is proper... Proper referencing. Hmm. Don't worry, King George. It's nice to see you. Sure, Matt. Go on, go on. Buying high end and pre built is always a rip off, but I need something. Did did it? Then anyway, what is weird is this was published in 2018. Wonder why it was sent now. There was another book on the same topic published this year, but a different author, Mark Felton. Yeah, but I do wonder if that's why it was sent. Is that someone is basically going? Well, Mark Felton's jumped in on the act and has produced a book, and this one, the older book, is actually darn good. I haven't read the Felton one yet, but honestly, the reviews have been a bit mixed, some of the ones I've been hearing from my friends on it. But this one, I hadn't heard about until it was sent to me. And then I looked it up, and I was honestly incredibly impressed. It's probably because this one comes from a very small publishing house. It's um, Matador, which do not produce a lot of books at all. Uh, they are lovely, though. They are a British publishing house, and it's printed actually in Cornwall. But it is... It's well worth reading. It's well worth looking at. And if you're interested in the China Station, this is the book to get. Hmm. Bishon, just bought it for $50, including shipping and, uh, from a bookshop on eBay from Sparks, Nevada. Our prices on eBay and Amazon much higher, and about $60. Ooh. This is I wouldn't mind a book. What's the price? As I said, it's a, it was £25 on Amazon when I looked up this week. Um, because after I got it, I wanted to look up the price and see how much it was. Because I honestly... When I got this sent through the post, and it was nice, and it was sent courtesy, the person had written to KCL, said they wanted to send a book to read. KCL gave out my address, very helpfully. It arrives. And with a nice note saying, this is a book for you to review. Hope you enjoy it. Very noisy moped just went past. And it's just been, it's been beautiful. And it, some of the stuff in here is just, I have a feeling I'll be going through this book for years and finding incidents and stories and all sorts of things in it to look into and to guide me into other paths. Because one of the great joys about it is if you are researching or interested in research at all, are the huge extensive research lists. And it's not really showing up on the lighting there. There you go. That it's got in it. Every single chapter has a huge extensive end notes giving you guides to archives, which archives this one's details are at, you know, where the documents are, how and what there's in what document. It's 
It's beautiful in that one. <sighs> Strub, is Doctor, is your book going to be hardback? It's going to be in both hardback and paperback. Hmm. So on the clock, do you watch Mark Felton's videos? Um, no, I didn't honestly realize he did videos. Hello, Kevin. Come on, come on, I ended up going full DT. Oh, cool. All right. So, next book. I said I was going to do this ages ago, and this is why this one got back in instead of one of the free ones, which, uh, as they didn't arrive. Uh, my Helmet for My Pillow by Robert Leckie. Um, I picked this up years ago in Amazon for... I think it was part of their free for £10 deal. And it's a lovely book. It is a true story by... Well, the thing about Robert Leckie is this is his own life story. This is what he did and what how he served and his own experience. And it is the war in the Pacific from the perspective of a U.S. Marine who really did fight his way through the Pacific War. And it's been shown part of it in the program, television series, The Pacific. But honestly... The Pacific is one of those programs which I think lost something because it toned everything down so that the audience would believe what was going on. Because the audience has to believe that you know, what World War II is like. And in that case, they wouldn't have believed half the stuff they get up to. Vision. Hardcover is cheaper, $25, but very few of them. Most of the books are in, in a search are the soft cover. Have to look hard for the hardcover. I'm still happy. Ooh. Jerison. I think Mark Fuld has done very good service to history, tidbits, that are just footnotes in mainstream history books, in fleshing them out and giving them the main remembrance they deserve. Probably. Um, as I said, I didn't realize he did videos on YouTube. I, and I haven't read the book. All I've heard is our secondhand reports about it. So, as I said, I personally won't comment on the book. I've heard second-hand reports which have been mixed, but I haven't got it yet. Um, when I do get it, I will have a read through it, and it'll get my honest opinion, you know? I think probably anyone who does hard work trying to get history out there deserves a good pat on the back. And speaking of pats on the backs, at the moment, um, there is a link down below. Now... I have decided that Jamie out of Armored Carriers and Drac don't get enough recognition for all the work they've done. There is an organization in the United Kingdom called the Maritime Foundation. They're a lovely organization. And every year they run the National Maritime Awards. Now, technically, there are already closed nominations for 2020. Technically. Just. But... Maybe if we make uh, there's a link down there of details and let a note a file put together by Brock, which there is a link down below in my description of this channel of this um, program. And the idea is if we send in enough letters, or send enough notes, either they get put in the 2020 one, they might do, you never know, they might be nice if there's enough people pressing for them to be considered. Or they get definitely nominated for the 2021. From previous experience of watching the stuff going into the National Maritime Awards, I do know it takes quite a campaign, especially for the first Sea Lords Digital Media Award, which is what Drac would qualify for. Especially to show that you have the impact required necessary to do it. And it takes quite a lot of people writing in for quite a long time to get it. So maybe if we put enough pressure, we get them in for the 2020. Because they haven't announced who are the nominees yet, or who are the uh, who are the people in contention, uh, by, and that's not usually announced till uh, late September, Octoberish time. They literally have just closed. Uh, maybe 
if we don't get that, but we will make them give them a very good running to be involved uh, to get the 2021 awards. And I think the Desmond Wetton Maritime Journal uh, Naval Maritime Journalism Award is definitely what Jamie should be getting because Jamie has been a journalist. So Jamie Seidel has uh, Jamie Armacaris has been a journalist for many many years. He has done countless work to promote. Not necessarily to just promote naval affairs, but to promote discussion of it, to make sure it's discussed as widely as possible in international relations. Maritime is all the stuff he does in the armored carriers, which he does entirely off his own back, pays for entirely out of his own public good, doesn't do any advertising, doesn't do any patron funding, anything, does it entirely himself. And I think he deserves recognition. And Drac, it's self explanatory. The man's amazing. He's built a 150,000-plus subscriber YouTube channel. He does five-minute naval histories, which are watched by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. They need to be awarded. They need. They deserve the awards, and I'm going to try and push for them to get them, because they really do work blooming hard. If someone sends me a link, I'll go have a look at Mark Felton's channel as well at some point. Mm hmm. Jermak, with the old breed on Pelu, on Okinawa, read by, uh, by Eugene Sledge, read it in one day, back to back. I've also got that somewhere and read it back to back. I read it and my helmet for my pillow at the same time. They are excellent, excellent books. Hmm. Jerish and Drax quite well known these days. Jamie and you aren't. Mm. Uh, you see, I have to agree with that to an extent. It's it's going to sound strange. I am. Um, I wouldn't say I was well known outside of academic circles, but in academic circles, I have managed to achieve a bit of a notoriety. I think that's fair to call this a notoriety. Um, mainly uh, my claim to fame, and I'm often billed as this and given quite good slots in conferences because of it, is I am the lecturer, uh, the conference speaker who never uses notes, walks around the room talking and is quite loud and chatty and engaging. And usually they give me fairly good slots because I usually get quite well attended. But outside of academia, no. Uh, maybe the book, maybe the YouTube channel, Twitter, all these things will change that, but no. Uh, Jamie is well known in Australia to an extent, but he isn't well known enough for the work he does. It's amazing how when you look at start looking at his publication history, he need, he should be more well known for all he's done. And as I said, Drac is very well known now on YouTube and has built this all up, but he hasn't had the recognition I feel he deserves. He deserves an award, it's my opinion, and so that's why I'm pushing for it. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you, everyone. Drac was on a World of Warships live stream the other day with Jingles, although Drac's location was given as near Bath, which seemed weird. That does <laughs> seem weird, because I know where I am. And Well, that brings me to the next one, because... <laughs> This is a book which I have ch uh, which I picked because of its name and what it's called about. Mm. Just checking, I'm not missing questions. Jerison, thank you. Uh, Jeff Beeler, are you allowed to drink at all your presentations? No, this is a pint at one. There, that was a pint of Coke. And I do drink at all my presentations. Sometimes I bring my own iron brew with me. Um, I remember one where my very nice girlfriend, before I went up, for, for, suddenly produced a bottle of iron brew, gave it to me and told me, you're going to need this because you're going to be talking a while. And the reason I was going to be talking a while was because 
I was going up and I was told, oh, uh, Alex, we don't worry. Um, the other two speakers from this panel have dropped out. But we sure you won't mind filling in the whole time. So I had to turn what was supposed to be a 15 minute presentation into a 45 minute presentation. As you can tell, that was so hard for me. Really hard. <laughs> oh. oh. Tom's right. Mark Feldman's book on the translation was first published in 2013. Covers longer time span. Hmm. Interesting. Well, this one is... Very, very good. That's what I'll say about this one. It's very, very good. I haven't read Mark Felton's one. So, over, over the battlefield, Operation Epsom by Ian Daglish. Now, you can guess why I picked that up. I, of course, live in Epsom, come from Epsom. Um, so, the moment I saw a title which said Operation Epsom, I picked it up. So, even though it is not a naval battle, it has. Let's actually. I have an idea. Right. Even though it's not a naval battle, turn it off. If that's a bit dark. Tell me. But there you go. You can see now. Wednesday, the 28th of June, and it's got lots of plans, pictures. It's a pretty interesting fight, and Operation Epsom is often forgotten as part of um, Normandy Exchange in favour of other battles which are far more memorable, have been turned into movies. But Operation Epsom really, really is good, and really is cool, and this is a very, very good book. It's worth a read. That's better. Mm, yeah, that's better. Still a bit white. E by gum. Uh, let's turn it down. Right, hopefully that's got the light right. Sorry about that. Um. <laughs> Jeff Beeler, are you allowed to drink at all? Notice the pint one. I meant the audience. Um, at the one I was at, which is recorded on here, uh, yes, you are allowed to drink at that one. It's actually hosted in a club. It's um, uh, a, basically a special talk which they invited me to down in Portsmouth. And it was a lovely one to go to. I, I, it's one of the public lectures I've done. I get to do occasionally, I get invited to do public lectures, and I'm always happy to go and give talks about various naval and all sorts of history stuff. Um, I've done one at King's. Which, I have to say, the thing that made me really nervous at King's was when I did it, I had my... Not quite girlfriends. I miss my girlfriend, but before we were started officially dating, or actually started dating, I had to put it. Because I was taking my own, uh, being very long winded about actually getting to the point of dating, um, her mum and dad were in the audience as well. So, yeah, that was, um, that was a kind of perform or die. Luckily, I think I did okay. Um, Operation Epsom was one of the uh, Allied armoured attacks into in Nor during Normandy, um, and basically it was the main thing which would uh, once Operation Epsom was done, it sealed off Normandy and stopped the Germans being able to counterattack and drive the Allies out of Normandy. So. Yeah, it, no, Epsom is a pretty important little attack, but it's it's forgotten. And it's quite a cool one because there's all sorts of crocodile tanks and other stuff in it. I, I like this one because of...
the pictures, the books, and the, the, the writing is clear and concise. Ian Danglish does a very good job. Yes, it might not be Navy, but if it's a book which, an army book, which has kept me interested in it, then it's a fairly well written army book. Um, Strub, well, Doctor, what is the longest you have lectured spoken at a conference for? Uh, the longest university lecture I've ever given was four hours, which was fun, to 800 students. And that was from mm, 1 p.m. till 5 p.m., so that was fun. Um, I used to have regular 9 a.m. slots at one point in my life, career. The longest I've ever done in a public conference, public lecture, was um, a, I was invited to do a public talk, and it was at King's, and it was the one there, and I went on for two and a half hours. It's fun. Mm-hmm. Well, no, it was the forerunner to Operation Goodwood. That doesn't surprise me. Hmm. Uh, you need one of those fancy things at universities. Uh, at universities allow you to project pages from books. I actually have one of those. I actually do have one of those systems around here somewhere. Um, it was very nicely bought for me by my university. I just can't remember where it is at the moment. But I do have... Oh, there it is. I have a home one, but I just haven't set it up yet. It's... um. They sent me this, a digital microscope, which I will get up and running at some point and see if I can make it work with this as well. Probably should be able to, because as far as this will be concerned, it would just be another picture. We'll see. It's arrived. I'll figure it out. Sure, man. Really hope warships are Jesus. <laughs> mm, could be good. Paul Johnson. Uh, is Epsom in Yorkshire? Uh, no. Sorry. Mm hmm. Bijan, in favour of you reviewing all military history, engineering, railway books. I am slowly working on that. You know, if people want to send me books, I'm happy to review them, and I'm buying as many as I as Patron will allow me to. Basically, the more money I get in Patron, the more that just goes on books. That really just does go on books. This month's is going to be a lot of Brassies books. Considerance, I did not even bother lecturing for my three-hour courses. It's too much. I have to say, for the four-hour one, um, it was a one-off lecture, and it was for the master students, and it was because it was suddenly found about... Haven't, we haven't had to do it since. Uh, uh, about a month and a half, six weeks or so, before they had the hand-in deadline for their dissertation, that they honestly, what had been presumed that would be of their academic skills didn't exist. So they ended up having to do have that. And then this year, they that's the reason I have a, every Tuesday, I have two hour online seminar with the whole of the master students from the whole of the department to make sure that doesn't happen on the moment. That's what we're doing. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Jeff Miller, I hope you took a break during the four hours. Uh, to be honest, not really. 
I couldn't speak for about a day afterwards. But very nicely, the um, module leader pretty much supplied me with iron brew and all sorts of other things so that I could keep going. Um, what should we do next book? Yeah, this one. So as we're on the army books... Um, weapon of choice. Small arms and the culture of military innovation. Matthew Ford. Now, I really enjoy this book, and you can tell that not only because it has quite a cool bookmark, which my girlfriend gave me for books, which is quite a cool one. I, I, I you know, I collect the leather ones, but I also have these ones, which my girlfriend gives me which are these sort of lovely magnetic ones which click over the page, which are quite good when you're dealing with books which don't like leather ones, because they don't have the space. <laughs> uh, for HDMI... Uh, Kevin, thank you. For HDMI book hookup cable for your pages, or a 2x4 piece of wood for a homemade desk extender. That is tempting. So, this is weapon of choice. And I've come up with the trick of I've moved the light source in front, uh, in front of it. Now, Weapon of Choice is written by a friend of mine called Matthew Ford, who there are no pictures in here. It is that kind of book. But it's The Small Arms and Culture of Military Innovation by Matthew Ford. What I would call it is really why we buy the rifles we buy, why we buy the pistols we buy in modern Western militaries. It's really quite a cool book, but it's not a light read. So this is something which, if you're interested in why weapons are procured, the weapons, especially the small arms are procured, that are procured, is absolutely excellent. But if you're just looking for a general read, I wouldn't go for it, because it is quite a heavy read. It is a good read, but it is a heavy read. It's transform. I, one and a half hours, two hours is the best lecture length for truth. That is the best, that is the ideal length, one and a half to two hours, but um, we don't always get that choice. Hmm. <laughs> Afternoon, Kilo 19. Constantinus, if you want to send you material about naval history, how may you do so? If it's just files, usually I get people to send them to me via um, Discord. That usually works quite well. You can do file transfer on that one. Fun fact today, Peter Babington, 42 Command of Falklands, had taught both Blues and Royal Troop Leaders with the Force. UK and Force is sometimes a small world. They are. And I think you'll find Peter Babington, I think I might have been, he might have been one of the ones who I interviewed. I didn't seem to remember the name from one of the, the, my interview list, but it might not be. From Simsec, the Falklands thing. <laughs> Good one. It is a good one. All right, then. Next one. For a slightly more modern read. Okay, I haven't discussed this before, but um, in Australia, they have this lovely group called the Sea Power Centre, who I seem to get sent their books quite often to review by whichever journals I'm with. Doesn't matter which journal I'm chatting with, um, whether it's Marine du Nord or... 
British Commission for Military History's journal or whatever journal it is I'm working for, they, I, the moment I put my name down there, if they have a Sea Power series, a Sea Power Central Australia, it seems to come my way. So I have a great collection of these little blue books. And they have all sorts of fun titles, but really they're actually very, very cool if you want to understand the future of the navies and the troubles they're dealing with. And this one is Networking the Global Maritime Partnership, which sounds really quite dull, but it's actually very interesting because it goes into all the communications issues. Again, it's not a picture-heavy book, but... If you want something that's really good, if you are naturally a techie person who's interested in computers, in communications, in that sort of thing anyway, this is going to be really cool. So I think there's a few of you on here who do fall into that category. This is it. And it's by Stephanie Hazich, uh, George Galosti, Terry McKerney, and Darren Sutton. And it's by the Sea Power Centre Australia. And it is, they've got a whole series. And they're really, really cool. The interesting thing about the Sea Power Centre is I think it's run as part of the Royal, of the Royal Australian Navy, really, in my mind. Um, that's what it seems to always have them in charge. Oh. Jeff Beeler, fun fact from the Steph's, uh, uh, fun fact from the Simsec interview. Ah, that doesn't, exp that does surpri that doesn't su that surprise me now. But it's a, it's an interesting time. Lots of interesting stuff in there. So if you're interested in communications, if you're interested in that sort of thing, little book, but very good. I've got a few ones, actually. I've got their carrier aviation one as well somewhere, and their amphibious warfare one. Amphibious warfare one is pretty darn cool. There's a lot of debate on which side the sh shooting from, which I presume has started from me talking about Matthew Ford's book. Interestingly enough, I won't get into it and reveal it in here, but there is actually a section in here about um, some of the testing that went on for the right-handed, left-handed shipping, and it's fun times. So, sorry, I have missed it currently, what the book was. I think it, possibly it was... Um, mm, it, I think I did actually... If it's the one I think it was, then I did mention it. I read it out loud. Stafford Thompson, Stafford Thompson. Yeah, I, I, it's now very, very far back in the questions. I'm not sure where it is. Looks down at, at Barn Hammer. Barn Hammer looks clean and unused. Looks away from Barn uh, Hammer. Hmm. Right then. Ooh, next one. Yeah, it's going to be that one. So, in honor of Michael Clapp who is, of course, recording not is recording on Tuesday the with the Bilge Pump crew for the Amphibious Shipping Special, and is currently reading everything up himself, so he feels completely up to date and causing us to have to do all sorts of more research than we normally would do. We were already going to be doing extra research anyway because he was coming on to make sure we were really up to sort of standard so we wouldn't let him down. And now he's off doing his own research, so we are having to go read everything. Um, Michael is incredibly active, incredibly mentally. It, it, the, uh, honestly, the guy makes me feel ancient. Blackburn Buccaneer. As you can see, this one was £7 in my local book same store. Um, it's the Owner's Workshop Manual, all marks, 1958 to 1994. And it's produced by Haynes. 
Written by Keith Wilson. And it's just cool. It is just cool. It is a lovely book to have. One of the lovely ones to have. It's got all sorts of stuff in here. All sorts of cool pictures. It's well written. It's got what them operating the South African Air Force. It's got them operating with the Royal Net Fleet Air Arm. It's got all the stuff about them, and it is just cool the amount of stuff they get up to. And it's when it's reading this, you find out oh, the reason they've got this funny shaped Bombay is because of all oh, that, and there's that, and the structure, and this, and that. And you know, it, it becomes really quite a cool thing to read. So. Very, very cool. Not sure. My apologies, a bit going on there. Uh, it was Everyday Heroes, Inspirational Stories from Canadian Forces by Unflinching, edited by Joe Milk. Mmm, cool. I'll have a look and see if I can track it down. Or if someone wants to send, send it to me. But, you know, as I said, I enjoy doing the book reviews, and I enjoy this book is also is something fun to review. Uh, it's probably a lot cheaper. Is my, Jeff Beale, is Michael Clapp in the Buccaneer book? He is mentioned in here somewhere, actually, from memory. But remember, he was the first observer to ever command a squadron. And not only did he get... Uh, he got the first Buccaneer Mark II squadron, just to give him fun. And uh, on top of that, he had to make it nucleus... Uh, get it nuclear certified. And they had he had to get it nuclear certified in half the time they normally took to get a squadron certified. So, um... Yeah, he had a fun time. He got that all done. Cool book. Very cool book. I like the Haynes Manual series. I have a few of them. But mainly I was sort of putting in there because some of the books I'm going to be doing here is, are more expensive and some of them are cheaper. Yeah, it is a shame that they kind of weren't around for any other war other than the first Gulf War. Um... It would have been so much nicer to have a decent carrier in the Falklands. Mainly from the airborne early warning point. I, people always get find me funny at this, but actually, you know, they go, oh, the Phantoms would have been good to have, or the Buccaneers would have been good to have Falklands. No, the best advantage the Ark Royal had over what was available in the Falklands was the Fairy Gannet. And basically, if anyone wants to say different, you can come fight me on that one. Um, because if you'd had airborne early warning, A, you could have teed up all the ships properly to the incoming Argentinians, and B, you could have been better at uh, focusing the fighters. So even if you'd had Harriers and the Gannet, you would have had a far better scenario. As it is with Phantoms and a Gannet, oh my... The Gannet wasn't exactly the best airborne early warning aircraft in the world, but it's a lot better to have airborne early warning than it isn't. Hmm. I heard a story that during an exercise in America, two buccaneers hid under a Vulcan flying at low level. Yes, I've heard that story too, and I've seen pictures of it. Or rather, pictures of the underside of a Vulcan taken from a buccaneer, so I'm presuming that's what they were doing at the time. Uh, Golden Eagle, Dr. Clark. The RF did operate in Nimrod Airborne. A no, they didn't. Sorry, no. They didn't. In fact, let me just check. Fairly sure. Uh, the British, the Nimrod AEW, let's see, and didn't enter service till 1984. Retired in 1986, and uh, so first flight in 1980, but didn't definitely didn't get deployed down to Chile in 1982. So, no. Sorry. 
No, that's one of those urban myths, kind of like that. Um, and I think it only ever served with the Joint Trials Unit, I think. Um, yeah. It was really not great. So sorry, Golden Eagle. That's one of those myths about the Falklands War. Like the Royal Navy managed to lose a carrier and build another one and get it down there within a couple of weeks. Or a few days, actually. It's almost worked out. Um, hmm. I don't want to be that guy, but would the Iron have actually deployed them? At least initially. The Iron was rather lax in air defense. No, the Iron wasn't lax in its air defense. It didn't have them, so it couldn't deploy them. But if it had had them, they would have been deployed as part of the carrier group. So if you consider what happened, uh, what you've got, the entire Sea Harry is an air defense fighter. It isn't a ground attack aircraft. That's why the the, the RAF Harriers are deployed. Uh, the whole thing... it. They are, are in a fairly hot turned on for air defense in the period. The only thing that I would say they're lacking is they got rid of the 40 millimeter cannon too early. They should have had that more widely fitted. Um, and gone in according to Lindy Bage. Well, then Lindy Bage is no, uh, wrong. Sorry. Um, Jerison, <laughs> uh, I flew something out of Chile in 1980. Might have been a. Uh, Herc or something. I read a book about it. Also, Nimrod was moral to carry AIM-9s in 1982, so it doesn't surprise me. I, no. I, I'm sorry. I, I do hear a lot of these stories about there being Nimrod things flown out of Chile. Chile wasn't about to start a war with Argentina for it. There was enough trouble with, our, with our helicopters when they turned up, uh, when a helicopter crashed in Chile. Their various flights do go down to Chile, but they're not operating out of Chile to support. And airborne early warning would have been really, really nice, but it weren't operating out of Chile. Jeff Beeler, if a Nimrod went down to AS, uh, it was an ASW, more of a sensor than an LNIP platform. That could have been. If there was a, the only Nimrod to which the Royal Air Force had really working at the time were the anti submarine warfare and the LNIP ones. And frankly, again, mostly they were those ones when they were operating were operating out of Ascension Island with tanking. This is the thing. One of the joys of operating out of Chile is to operate out of Chile and avoid Argentine air defense. You'd have to fly right down south, then and then come up. And you'd have no tanker support. Whereas if you come down from Ascension, you can have a tanker come down on station. Say you're a couple of hours on station, if you the maximum, and then tanker back up. Um, it's, you know, the long range aircraft do not need to base out of Chile. They don't need to do that. That would be a whole level of complexity added operation you don't need. If you have a big aircraft which has air-to-air -air refueling and can take multiple flight crews, like the Nimrods, like the uh, the big aircraft, they come from the Ascension, uh, Ascension Island, and they weren't there. That's, you know, Vulcan bombers and transport aircraft. Sounds right. Nimrod in Chile claim is mentioned in the book. Yeah. Mm. I'm sure someone's written a book about it. Jeff Beeler, I've seen Lindybergh's video. It was a passive element mission only. Listening from inside Chilean airspace, not part of painting radar. That sounds, if it's a, if anything, that would sound more likely. An element and doing that. And there's not an AEW, not an airborne early warning or anything like that. Um, for Nimrod, Elnin, maybe doing that from inside Chilean airspace. That I can sort of see the reasoning for, and probably you can keep that quiet, and the Chileans might not object to that. But I don't think airborne early one is going down there. There wasn't one in available. I found a number of P nine uh, P R nine cameras, and a Herc was used for AEW out of Chile in nineteen eighty two. 
Again, how's the hurt going to be used for airborne early warning? And how's the cameras going to be used? They don't, they're not Elmin aircraft. The Herc is probably going down there as transport supplies for the... Maybe the cameras are down there as photo reconnaissance assets. But these are not aircraft that can do airborne early warning. To do airborne early warning, you need a big colossal radar, for starters. Or you're out there as electronic warning aircraft and doing element reconnaissance, in which case you're listening for radio and radar transmissions, which is a very different mission. And element is, sounds possible, but airborne early warning isn't the same thing. And it's going to sound strange. You cannot do airborne early warning with element. You can't do element with airborne early warning, really. Hmm. Right then. Um. Next book. This is some fun. Yeah. As Jeff spots, don't confuse element listening with airborne early warning. There is a difference between the two. We, you need both. And that's why I find it strange from people going, we're getting the new airborne early warning aircraft so we can get rid of our electronic reconnaissance aircraft. You can't. You need both. You need, the RAF needs both. They do. Really do. Mondarty. I heard a story for uh, the Yanks offered us a carrier for going south. Is there any truth in that? No. And honestly, the British wouldn't have wanted an American carrier. Okay, American carriers will require about 5,000 crew, which would have taken a huge chunk of the Royal Navy even at that time, let alone today. Um, secondly, you'd have then had to certify, train up all the pilots, everyone to operate it. It's taking long enough at the moment for us to get it, and they were using aircraft we're already trained. It was sort of trained in and just sort of going these things. If you were suddenly taking aircraft which are completely new, um, all those things, yeah, no, and no. Jeff Eler, that sounds sensible and Elnint possibly. Hmm. Je Turnhouse. So you're saying specialized equipment for a specific job isn't in shape or something else. Shocker. I know it really is. So this actually brings us to actually one of the other books we got to. And um, I based an entire course I taught in Cambridge at a summer school that uh, on this. At, it was based out of Jesus College, Cambridge, and it was it was a lovely summer school. It was called the Future of War, the course, and I had some absolutely amazing students on it. They were all under 18s. Um, it was a summer school thing, and they mostly American, a few from other places in the world, Australian, all sorts of things. But you know, it was fun. And it's called The Future of War by Lawrence Freeman. It's a history of the future of war. So it's The Future of War, a history. And it's a really, really cool book. It's basically all about pe how people predict, his uh, predict the future of war through history and how wrong they have been. Occasionally how right they've been, but often how wrong they've been. And... Um, he has quotes in here like this. The passion and desire to prevent war determined the whole initial course of direction of the study. Like other infant sciences, the science of international politics has been markedly and frankly utopian. In a book first published probably in 1909 as Europe's Optical Illusion, and the next year across the world as The Great Illusion, Norman Agnell, Paris editor of Daily Mail, sought to demolish the idea that war made any sense at all. He noted the widespread assumption that a nation's relative prosperity is broadly determined by its political power. The nation's being competing units advantage in the last... Resort goes to possess a preponderant military force. The weaker goes to the wall, as in the other forms of struggle for life. He insisted that the illusion in the title referred to the idea that war could be beneficial, not that it would occur, it could, could occur at all. Unfortunately, people have often taken this as believing that the whole idea of going to war is right is wrong and it's never going to happen. Da, 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 da. Actually, what he says is military power doesn't necessarily guarantee you are the most powerful nation, but without it, you're, 
if the war breaks out. It's a really, really good book. Um, there you go. Lawrence Freeman's The Future of War, A History. It's really, really cool and really does get you into some interesting things. An AEW nail that aren't the same as electronic attack because these things are all those things are complicated. Yeah. Um, sure not. From what I understand, the potential carry offered wasn't a full size carry, rather one of the smaller LHD variety. Even more complicated. And again, what advantage does it give the Royal Navy? They already have many of those carriers of that size. No, it's sort of, it, I don't think it was actually offered. There was probably discussions in the US about what they could offer the British, but it was never actually offered. Vision. I read the USM was thinking of offering RN in Falklands and Amphid. USA was pro uh, Brit, but a statement on not, USN was pro Brit, but a statement on not so much. I think it was a USN article, I article. There were probably lots of things about their thinking they offered, but they never actually offered them because they knew they probably wouldn't be accepted. Because again, even a wasp requires a huge amount of crew compared to the British equivalent. Sadmiral, I remember Mr. Jones on Twitter dug up something about a mental scheme for the RF to fly recce missions over Falklands from a CVN with bucks. Don't think it got further than a memo somewhere. Probably. It was the I USS Iwo Jima? Sorry, again. Honestly, what the British would have probably preferred would have been one of the Aegis cruisers. If we could have had one of those, we could have had a lot of fun. Because um, the entire British defence system had been designed around the idea in that, at that point that we would be operating the Americans and there would be an Aegis cruiser along with the groups to help coordinate the air defense. And then they found they didn't have one, so they were... Because someone had made a money-saving a money, money saving suggestion. The Royal Navy had wanted it, but the Royal Navy the only, the only Royal Navy had only managed to build one Type 82 because they were told, well, there'll always be an American there, and if there isn't, you'll have the one single Type 82 ready. And then, what you know, the Type 82 is in freaking refit when Falklands War happens. She ends up leading the final task group down. She's coming down because if war had gone on longer, she would have been there and would have been critical. But you sit there and go, you could, everyone could see that happening. If you only have one and rely on your allies to provide the others, it happens. Um, Night Heron Production. A big military does not make a great nation, but without it, you're in a lot of trouble. Yep. Ron Shebb, The Future of War by Freeman, the same author who wrote the official history of Falklands campaign, which has information on possible use of Nimrods in Chile. It does, but I doubt it would. They would be they would be AEW uh, Nimrods. I have heard about Elmin and ASW aircraft uh, making visits down there. I did never really thought in myself, from my own experience and knowledge, that they were based down there. But maybe I could be wrong. But definitely no airborne early warning. It, it, really, there would have been. If there had been airborne early warning down there in the British side, it would have been a very different war. Because one of the troubles that the Harriers have is they're often playing catch-up. If you imagine if there was airborne early warning down there, they would have been able to play ambush. And that would have been a very different scenario for the whole system, which is, of course, why the Type 40, the 42-22 combo start being put in place, to try and give the Harriers the chance to play Ambush. And they get, they ex extend these pickets forward, and they just, you know. It happens. The Falklands War happens a lot. Ah, oh, Costa Travis. Oh, like the US and, and, and Navy and Mountubers. You don't know what you're missing until you need them. Eh, yep. 
Sav Thompson, uh, Doctor, uh, what, why would any na Navy build a one-off warship in the Monday? Two's company, three's fun, four for the school. Uh, yeah, you know, look, let's put it this way. Multiples of three, everyone. And really, the Royal Navy should currently be building, uh, should have had nine Type 45s. They should have had 18 Type 23s. And that is what we should still have in service. So we should have had 27 escorts in service. And we could actually be doing what we're supposed to be, all the stuff we're supposed to be able to do. Um, how about Dr. Clark, how about alternate scenario where five battleships were kept and sent to shell the Rio Grande uh, on a night raid? Uh, I would prefer not to. Samuel, all we had for AW was some Shackleton AW2s, all of which are still in the UK, obviously. AW Nimrods were proposed, but it was one of the most we won't go into the AW Nimrods. This is one of the reasons why when someone says it was done in Chile, I sincerely doubt it. Um, in 1980, when they first ended, no, they don't end it. There is a reason they, in the nicest way, they literally end the service in 1984 and are cut in 1986. They're that bad. <sighs> the Argentines were also operating at such extended ranges they couldn't afford extended engagements. Yes, which is another thing. If you had been able to do ambush. You would have really and uh, really caused the Argentines a lot of trouble. So you went, woke up late, tried to watch a, a fake baseball game last night, about as exciting as my old uh, baseball game. Oof. Jeffy, how much control did Clap have? Michael Clap have a helicopters on frigates and the army's halos. Uh, well, all the navy halos, which were for amphibious transportation, were his. All the ASW halos, which were still operating as ASW halos, were operating with their carriers, or their ships or their carriers. And the few army helicopters which got down there caused them a lot of headaches because they kept the 5th Brigade kept not telling the Navy what they were doing. And then they got shot down. And the Navy went, We have helicopter lanes. If you fly out of the helicopter lane, and don't, worse, don't even tell us where you're airborne. So, Dr. Clark, how many animals were kicking themselves in 82 for not having Vanguard? She would have been mighty useful, but again, how much could you use her for? Basically, she could have been used for shelling tumble down and a few other things, and probably in the nicest way, if she'd rocked up next to Goose Green, there wouldn't have been actually a battle. It would be in case of, we can fight you, paratroopers, uh, but you have that looking at us. Looking at us. Looking at us. Please stop it looking at us. Tell it to turn the guns around. It doesn't need to fire. Um, and Belgrano would have probably had a... Instead of being sunk by a submarine, the Royal Navy would probably go, You know what? <sighs> Just hang back. <laughs> Vanguard's coming. But as it was, they didn't have her, and they didn't have the crew for her, so no. They didn't even have the crew to activate HMS Belfast or anything like that, so that's it. Well, the lots of AA guns, the 40 millimeters on the Vanguard, would have been really useful in San Carlos. Seriously, the 40 millimeters on the Vanguard would have been so useful in San Carlos. Right. Getting away from the Falklands to... This book. Okay. The naval route to the abyss. The Anglo-German naval race, 1895 to 1914... Edited by Matthew Seligman, Frank Nagler, and Michael Epanos. Um, this is one of those books which are really cool. And I got it sent to me by... Um, to review. And it was published in 2015, and it's the Council Naval Records Society. It's got... 
chapters including Turbot's Ascendancy, uh, Recognizing the German Challenge, the Royal Navy, 1898 to 1904, Obstacle, Success and Risks, the German Navy, 1905 to 1907, Meeting the German Challenge, the Royal Navy, 1905 to 1907, Turbot's Triumphant, German Naval Policy, 1908 to 1911, Surpassing the German Challenge, the Royal Navy, 1908 to 1911, and end decay, German naval policy, 1912-1914. Defeating the German challenge, the Royal Navy to 1912-1914. So when Paul from Chicago says the Royal Navy had already won before either, uh, won the naval race before World War I broke out, this book basically backs out. Thank you, Osprey28. Thank you. Um, this was sent to me a while ago to do a review. I did review it. Hence, this is a review copy. Um, Sometimes you get books like this. So this isn't actually the cover it has now when it's on for sale. It's produced by Rutledge. And it's the Navy Record Society Publications. And it's just cool. It's very cool. I got it sent to review. I did my review for it. And it's, it's a lovely book. And I'm a bit biased because Matthew Seligman was one of my examiners for my Viva. So he was an amazingly nice guy then. And he produces a very, very cool book. It's very interesting to read. It's got all sorts of facts and figures. Again, it's not got pictures in it, but it is, if you're interested in probably one of the most thorough books dealing with the build up to World War One from a naval perspective and all the things that went on on both sides, comparing British and German. This book, The Naval Route to the Abyss, is absolutely fantastic. Hmm. <laughs> Generation, I believe a lot of the army helicopters went down on an Atlantic conveyor. It left a single Chinook, a couple of Pumas, and a few scouts. Not sure if a gazelle was used. Um. <laughs> and Doctor, uh, what is one area that each of the modern navies did not put uh, not put uh, not putting enough effort into? Um. I'd say they're putting. Uh, I'd say the areas they're not putting enough into are presence, and probably because that requires numbers of ships. And I would say they're putting a lot of effort into amphibious warfare from the Royal Marine, from the Marines' perspective, the troops going ashore. They're not necessarily thinking about it from the shipping perspective. It's one of the reasons what's motiv that's motivated motivated bilge pumps, and it's been really interesting because I've been reading. This is. Uh, some of the reading I have for bilge pumps on Tuesday. And the article which interested me was what's called Chapter 3, Australia's Future Amphibious Capability. And what was interesting about that was they were looking at exactly the same ideas and doctrines which we're now all calling revolutionary about using smaller ships instead of bigger ships for their amphibious warfare. And the big problem they found was that if you want to do light and high speed, you need to be able to land about a company strength of, amphi of forces straight in a go, which means you need roughly six flight deck spaces. You aren't going to get a small ship which has six flight deck spaces for six helicopters. Because even if you go for bigger helicopters which can carry more personnel, which of course means if you lose one, you lose more of your force, which is a really problematic... A, they're going to carry bigger weapons, which are going to take up more space in the helicopters, and B, you're going to want to launch some attack gunships with them as well, especially to cover those helicopters in, especially the more, the fewer the helicopters you have them crammed into, the more you want to want, going to want gunships to protect them, because they're more, you, if you lose one, it's going to be problematic. So that's end up driving the size, and I think... The thing is, the U.S. Marine Corps can get away with a small, and this is what I'm going to be talking about with Michael and Jamie and Drac on when we're recording on Tuesday. Is the idea is you can build a smaller? That's fine if you're the U.S. Marine Corps and you can back it up with all the bigger ships they already have built and all the big amphibious sea lift capability that the, uh, the sea lift capability the U.S. Navy brings with it. But I think if you're a smaller nation, the two the 30,000 ton, 35,000 ton LHD is still going to be king of what you'll need for your Falcon's War, for your amphibious warfare.
Jeff Beeler, HMS Centaur in Operation Reserve, like Intrepid, would have been useful. It would have been useful if she could be activated. So, Thomas, didn't realize the RN was hurting that much for members at the time. It wasn't really hurting that much for members. It was just much reduced than it had been. Night Time Productions. Ark Royal Eagle had the Gannets. The Americans had the Hawkeyes. What will Queen Elizabeth Prince Wales have? Crow's Nest fitted Merlins. Hmm. Cherishan, tis France will Thatcher threatened and intimidated that Britain would use tactical nuclear strikes on Argentine bases if France sold any more exercise. That was the case, but there was one problem with that. Britain didn't have any tactical nuclear weapons. And didn't have any bombs left for the Vulcans. Um, they got rid of them all in the transfer to Trident, and they'd given them all to NATO stockpiles. So, uh, yeah. They, that was entirely massive bluff. Mike, Mike, if anyone needs Iron Brew in Florida, they sell it at Publix. Woohoo! If, they, if, I'm, when I'm, if I, when I eventually manage to visit Florida, I will enjoy and go to Publix. Crow's Nest will be deployed by next year's task force. It'll be fine. They'll be running late, but they always do run late. And it's actually... It's doing okay. It's been the main thing that got held up was because people didn't realise that despite it being a saltwater aircraft, does it shouldn't be left out in the rain, the one that sent there for sent there for testing. They thought because it was a naval aircraft, it was okay to leave it out in all the weathers. And they were sort of going, Yeah, you can leave it outside. We do have to have it operated outside, but we have hangers on ships. We drag it in as soon as we can. We don't leave it standing out there like it's some sort of poor dog chained in the backyard. You wouldn't do that to a dog. You don't do that to a million, multi-million pound helicopter. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, fixed. Okay, let's go with airborne early warning. Fixed wing aircraft are always considered the best for airborne early warning, but honestly, you have to go with the aircraft you have available to operate from the carriers you have available. And as I said, Britain, when it was planning on the Queen Elizabeth, was planning on replacing Albion and Bulwark and Ocean. With three LHDs. The idea being, once you get Queen Elizabeth, Prince of Wales in service first, then when Ocean is replaced in service, but because uh, she's supposed to be in service for a little longer, replace her with an LHD, then Albion and then Bulwark in turn. So you have a class of three LHDs. And you have five flight decks, which could all operate the same airborne early warning aircraft, all operate the same strike aircraft, all operate the same lift aircraft. So if worse comes to worst, you can launch an amphibious airstrike. Uh, the troop insertion from the carriers, and you can launch amphibious uh, uh, carrier strike equivalent from the LHDs if you've lost, if both carriers are out of action, or if all three LHDs are out of action. You know, that's the options. Uh, it makes sense in that circumstance. If you've got that as your basis of your formation, that makes sense. The trouble is, yeah. I suppose they've got to go with small ships, seeing as they sold part of Port Door into China a few years ago. Don't want to think about it. Actually, they didn't go to the small ships. The the lovely Australians go with a camera class, which is the thing. That's why they go with the big ships because of the carrier deck, because of the flight deck space needed. Hmm.
Uh, no, no one's buying the V22 at the moment. In nicest way, we just... What Britain have done is we're making the Merlins and current generation work quite well, and then we're jumping in with the future vertical lift programs in the United States. So expect to see the Merlin successor come from that. Good evening, Airman. Seth so, Thompson, Dr. Clark, that would be one great phone call. Thatcher, yes, NATO, I want my viewers. NATO, what? You want what? It would have been an interesting scenario. Jerry, Dr. Clark, the RS last three full nuclear weapons were decommissioned in 1993. They were NATO stockpile. Uh, they were REF weapons, but they were part of the NATO stockpile. They weren't. Okay, so American weapons are part of the NATO stockpile. There were also RAF we British weapons as part of the NATO stockpile, and there were French. Uh, there are French weapons as part of the NATO stockpile. Now there are no French and British weapons as part of the NATO stockpile, as I understand it, and they're all American weapons as part of the NATO stockpile. Okay, but they weren't British. They were assigned differently. It was the Cold War. It's weird. Okay. Martin Doherty, would it not have been better using Osprey for AWS? I know we used the Sea King for the Invincibles. Uh, no, because we'd have had to get in a new... Basically, if you add in the Osprey, you add in... Right then, can it do a... can it do the ASW? No. So you need to have the Merlins on there anyway. So you've got to have the Ospreys on there. So that's going to be another aircraft type, another set of logistics, another set of space technology. Basically, the idea is we use the Merlins for commando transport, for airborne early warning for anti-submarine warfare, and then we've got one aircraft type with one set of maintenance requirements, all these things, doing these three roles. So that's why you do it. Because basically, Queen Elizabeth, when they're on their most efficient carrier model, will be carrying F-35Bs and Merlins, and that will be it. So they'll be supporting two types of aircraft to do all their roles. Air defense, strike, anti-submarine warfare, airborne early warning, commando transport, the lot will all be done from two aircraft types. And then they'll be at their most efficient because they'll, they'll be able to maximize space and supplies for those two aircraft types to support them. Emin, are the hangars of the Central class tall enough to fit a CH-47? Ooh, that's an interesting question. I have to look up. Jeffrey, Clash was pissed at so many that, that, that many of his Wessex squadron were kept on the Central Island uh, instead of being sent south to replace losses. Yes, he was royally. Strub, could a lighter than air UAV be good for a future plan for AW? I, mm, I'm not quite sure. There's options, but uh, you know. George, the correction, WSE-7 free for retarded bomb was decommissioned in 1908. It could be carried by Harry's Wessex Buccaneer, Vulcan Buccaneer, and Canberra. Yeah. As I said, I thought they'd gone a bit earlier, but they, they could have carried on. There were British stops, which we hang around quite a lot. Oh. Adam Production, I clearly opened a can of worms I wasn't prepared for. My apologies. I'm just going to dig a trench and hide in a while. Very sensible, but don't worry. <laughs> Golden Eagle, not really, not really a fan of the F-35. Prefer to deploy something like a navalized Garepin. Well, if you want to pay for it to be developed, you can. But at the moment, the F-35B, F-35 is the only game in town. So that's the one we go for, especially for Vista, uh, Vista operations. Um, Samuel, unless we go absolutely woke and completely replace the Merlin with V22, SV22, ASW version for the Merlin, oh, that would just be nuts. But the V22 ASW version is really terrible. Um, right, now, let's start on a new topic. Let's start on a new book. Um, I've done this one, which is very, very cool. Again. So I'm going to do a really big one I've got next to me. Norman Friedman's British Submarines of Two World Wars. Means to look at. As is traditional in his books, huge, huge plans. Uh, this plan goes across the whole two pages. Um, 
that is, of course, the uh, lovely Osiris O-Class. Um, they are really, really quite cool, what they're getting into and what it goes through. And it goes through the fact that, you know, submarines really aren't submarines for quite a while, as we would all constantly think of them. They're more submersible torpedo boats. Um, but they are re it's really quite cool what they get into and what they're getting up to. And it starts off, and you see the little ones, and they really start off so tickly widdly. They do. Really, really tiny. This is Boats 1 to 5 of the Royal Navy Submarine Service. Plans of them. So if you're looking at this, if you're interested in submarines, this book is, as usual with uh, Norman, it is absolutely inclusive of everything from the two world wars. And it has so much stuff in it. It has some very good references. I have to say, it's one of the ones... When I got this, because I bought this because of the sub topic coming up this week on submarines. Um, I had a look through it, and I was reading it, got in, and I was absolutely amazed. I was absolutely resolved into it, because for his, it's... Okay, Norman Freeman never does a bad book, but he does have books which are uh, versus books which are eh. So books which are sort of, uh, it, it's good, but it's just Norman just almost going through the motions of producing. I've got to do to cover this topic, so I'm going to do everything, chuck everything in, done. Uh. And there are some books which really sort of sing, and they're going, ah, oh, they're really, really cool. This summary one is really, really cool. It's full of pictures. It's full of content. It's full of so much interesting stuff. And, um, you know, the four-inch gun on Thunderbolt here is particularly cool. You know, that just... It looks wrong for starters, but it is cool. And also, when you're thinking about modern submarine design and everything being on there being slinky and svelte and smooth and everything just flows over them. You look at these designs and they're clunky and they're going to make this noise and that noise and you seriously wonder how all of them weren't sunk by just people just going I can see it! Mm. Anglo-German Navy race was over before it started. British could always build cheaper and faster, if not individually superior in quantity, has a quality of its own. They Usually they were actually better as well, because the Royal Navy had lots and lots of experience of building ships. Um, Jerusalem, Dote's Clock. Uh, the no British built nuclear weapon was ever part of NATO's stockpile. Britain only ever received from the stockpile. Too expensive. Hmm, I'm sure I read... I'll get back to you on that one, because I seem to remember reading something that we did have several in there. And did, uh, did hand over all our drop bombs. But, you know, I could be wrong. Nuclear is not my... Nuclear is Lawrence Freeman's specialty. It's not mine. Um, I have to admit, as when it comes to nuclear weapons, I tend to keep as far away from them as possible. So it's the stuff I've read, and I'm going from memory. So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Uh, but... I was fairly sure that was the case of those. Hmm. Jeff Beeler, still see the World War One R class as lost opportunity. Yes, they were. This one, big bring bring back the big gun fleet submarines. <laughs> That's awesome. Didn't the World One subs only displace five hundred twelve hundred tons? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Jeffy, does stream include British Columbia's two uh, World War One submarines? Yes, it does. Includes pretty much everything in here. He managed to get all the stuff. And oh, seriously. <sighs> Talking about the R class. Here you go. Rover and Rainbow. You want to know if they were in here? They are in here, and it is gorgeous. The fact that they named the submarine Pandora and sent her to operate, and they actually put her in an op gave her an operational box is what always worries me. 
Because the fact that there was somewhere sitting there going, there's Pandora's box sitting on a map is just scares the life out of me. Paul Johnson, Dr. Clark, Centaur class hangar was 17 and a half feet high and the CH-47 was 18 foot, 8 inches high. So that's a no then. No fulfilling. Yikes. Uh, uh, townhouse, anything the subbook cover the knock-on effect of Gilbert Stevenson counter countering subs changing the future designs? Um... I haven't sorry, seen that, but I've only read through it about twice. If I read through it a third time, I might spot it. It's, it's colossal. It's like every normal Freeman book. It's literally... It is that big, that thick, and, you know, in the nicest way, it's... Uh, let's see. Where is it? It's 432 pages long... It's just, it's just colossal. Footnotes alone take up, well, the end notes alone take up, well, let's see, 356 to, still going, still going. Um, yeah, the, on their own alone, the um, foot end notes take up 45 pages. No, hang on, no, no. I tell a lie. 43 pages. Bad maths there. Hmm. There we went. Do, do, do. Hmm. Danny Freeman, Dr. Clark, does Freeman like the submarine stuff because it's close to physics and he's really a physicist with a hobby in naval history? Uh, possibly. Possibly. Jerishan, I was watching You Only Live tw You Only Live Twice yesterday. The submarine they had on it had a timber-lined admiral's office for MTUs and it even had a secretary's desk outside for Money Penny. Honestly, if there was an admiral who ever went to sea in a nuclear submarine, I wouldn't be surprised if he had that level of facilities. Then if I replace the M-Class gun with 24-inch torpedo tubes, do you think it would have been of use in World War II? Yeah. Golden Eagle, uh, uh, nicest way, I think you've been listening to too much uh, of one side of the argument. Uh, if you think, A, Bradley's or BMD food, have you? No, sorry. Um, there are, there are some very, very nice, uh, if the uh, Tshunga, uh, Tshunga, um, was on there, then that would sh probably chew up a Bradley, but not a BMD. The, the Russians do have some vehicles which could chew up a Bradley. Don't get me wrong. There are some, but not the BMD. Um, you have to be careful. You know, there's often a thing of you know, people go, yeah, yeah, this can all be that. No, there are some vehicles out there. It's not a universal thing. There are some, but there are also some which they do a lot of talk about, but no... Not happening, especially not Bradley's with tow missiles and all the other stuff they carry. Just no, and the latest refitted Bradley's. Oof. Um, Martin, no, no. didn't uh, Dr. Clark didn't a RN sub sneak into a Japanese anchorage before the war on a sneak and peek, just taking pics of the IGN fleet? I seem to remember reading it happened and was a peak loss. Yes, they did a lot of information. Going. Um, Daniel Freeman, Norman Freeman, scared of Australian spiders? I have no idea. <laughs> Jeff Beeler, in World War II, the UK ends up fighting in one theatre with subs designed for another. Big Far East boats in the med. Smaller med boats in the Far East later. Yeah. 
it's always the fun of times. Um, the T-Class were really designed for the Far East. The S-Class were designed for the Med and the North and the North Sea. The T-Boats are for the North Atlantic. So basically, you know, that's what they were really designed for. But mm. Hmm. <laughs> okay, there's lots of stuff going on the Bradleys, but I think I, I, I'm going to say my feeling is Golden Eagle's probably winding you all up on the Bradley one. It's like I, I think occasionally he does like to twist everyone's tail. That's my experience. Is what my assessment is, especially you know considering some of the things he picks on. F35, that is something up for debate until they've really been in combat and we've seen whether it does all work as advertised, especially some of the stuff that they're supposed to use in terms of stealth radar and working up with airborne early warning. Um, and whether stealth does turn out to be the advantage that everything's been banked on it. But Bradley's versus BMDs, I'm fairly sure he was winding you up on. Hmm. Constance, what's the deal with the Holland, the sub innovator, not province? I've heard that he got summary, he got into summaries because he was Irish and disliked the RN, but he did not seem adverse to working with them. Uh, there's a lot of myths around Holland, but honestly, he was just a businessman who liked to sell his subs. So, first of all, he marketed them off to the US Navy and the French and all these things. And depending on who he was selling them to, he would play up whatever part of his story would work. So, I'm Irish, so I don't like the uh, I don't like the British. So, I'm giving you this design to make sure you can uh, fight the British. And yes, it, it, will, it will help. It will, it, will, it, will, it will give you the advantage. And he goes, they, they go, yes, we'll buy it. And then when he's selling the British, have you seen that these guys have bought it? Well, I'm an Irish patriot. I love the British. I love the British. I love you. I love you. I, I, I got uh, six subs. Uh, would you like them? And it, um, it works quite well for him. It really does. Hello, Austin. Uh, Golden Eagle, I'm, I'm sorry, in that scenario, I would give Amelia Clark on Drogon a advantage versus Ivan Cosmobot in a MiG-15 best bit, literally because Drogon has, well, how do I put this politely? He has a lot of pent-up aggression. Paul Johnson, uh, Doug Scott, I heard the stuff could be beaten by changing wavelength for the radar signal. It can't be beaten, but its effectiveness is reduced by changing radar types. But there is, it's it's very good against the most common radar types, but for any form of stealth, it doesn't so much as defeat your stealth as... What stealth does is it works by reducing your radar terms, so it gives you longer advantage. Getting it. So you take the most common radar types, and that's what your stealth is protected is best protecting against. But if you go for one of the some of the more random, more exotic radar types, then it might not work as well against them. In terms, your detection range is going to be that much further. What that really deforms is how which which radars you take out first with your suppression of enemy air defense systems. So, in the nicest way, if there's an exotic radar which is going to push back against your stealth, that's going to be one of the ones which gets missiles sent at it first. High-speed anti-radiation missile away. Bye-bye. Down on the duck clock. Ah, the Irish. We will sell the both sides, but watch what neighborhood you walk through if you have... Yeah... Sure, Mike. I might have overreacted. It's just that exactly that kind of, the kind of thing that people who just compare stats and then carefully select the data for their preferred vehicle. Uh, welcome to the top Trump scenario. I get into that a lot. Speaking of top Trumps and various other things, right then, I've got a double billing for you. Allied Coastal Forces. <sighs> now, I've shown you one of these before, but I'm going to show you both of them. Because it's volumes one and two, and I hope to get volume three and four when they come out. 
Volume 1 is the Fair Mile on US Submarine in Designs and US Submarine Chasers. Volume 2 is the Vosta MTBs and US Elcos. Basically, each volume is going to be a different British and American design. They are so cool. They are so cool. It's really fun. It's a lot of fun to read. They are. They have a lot of stuff. They. Let's put it this way. Everything which occasionally I have, as I said, um, Freemans go from eh, which are good, but still, you know, not great to ah, uh, great. These are. All are, and they're not Freeman, but they're like Freeman. They're by Lambert and Ross, and they are just beautiful. They have beautiful plans. They have beautiful pictures in them. They have all sorts of information. And for anyone who's doing painting or modeling, they have color schemes. It's just, it's like you've got a combination between a Freeman book and one of those camouflage books, which I like to show you guys. They're just, they're just beautiful. They really are beautiful, and I have a lot of fun with them. And they have a lot of details in there. They have a lot of stuff about the information about them, and they go into an incredible amount of detail in terms of their design, their propulsion systems. And it's one of the reasons why I sit there and go, well, you know, uh, when I was doing the actual stuff on the small boats, and I was going, I can't really give you a definition for this because there's so many variations. Because this book, these books, really do get into all the different variations. And you could basically do a slide on each of the different types because of these books. They are fantastic. If you're interested in the little boat wars, in what torpedo boats get up to and what they're involved in, these and gunboats, these are really, really cool. Really cool. And what I love is this one has them going away from you on the front, sort of coming towards you on the back. And on this one, the painting is they are coming towards you on the front. And then on the back, they are going away from you. So they really have thought about the covers. They really have done a beautiful artwork. It, these are so, so worthwhile. They are expensive, though. But they are really worthwhile. Really, really worthwhile. My Mike, how many U-boats were sunk by merchant ships in World Wars? I remember hearing that it was common in World War I. It wasn't that common, but occasionally a few got rammed. If you're a merchant, if you're a submarine, you get caught on the surface by a merchant ship charging straight towards you. They will do a dreadnought. Um, Nikhtasia. Dr. Clark, is books on dreadnought gunnery still the best for examining the Poland versus Dreyer fire control summary? Yes. Is Brooks' book on dreadnought gunnery? Yes, it is. At the moment. Um, although this book has a fair amount about, in that, about that in it. And how the two sides both approached it. And it's one of the factors which they put in the British Advantage column that the British have actually, in their opinion, developed better fire control. And here, chain home basically can see stealth fighter much sooner than modern high frequency types. I understand it as the U.S. Air Force discovered at a British air show with a B two. Um, there was a very specialist infrared radar at an air show, a really fancy one, but really short range and really expensive. And basically, the B-2 was just doing a normal level, normal height flight. It wasn't at low level, and it didn't have all its electronic systems activated. So it got seen and detected, and they said, Oh, yeah, this shows we can detect the B-2. And the U.S. Air Force went, uh, not quite. Because you have to remember, there are a lot more things than just the skin and the what the aircraft is flying that help protect it. Um, sure, Mac. I love a good stack comparison, but I hate confirmation bias when you do it. That's why you have to be careful, Sean Mac. 
Awesome. So in a theoretical world where the JSF program turns out up null, how viable would it have been to further develop existing Vistal aircraft like Harry to bring them up to into the fifth generation? Not really. Um, you'd... Honestly, the British looked at it, and to get anything like approaching what they were going to need, they were going to need to build a completely new aircraft anyway. So you might as well join the F-35B program. That's what the British thought. Shrub, Doctor, can you comment on the length of modern ships that are being asked to serve? Um, on my pier, we have vessels commissioned in 1962, two in 1988, in 1989, one in 2000. How long do most navies keep their ships for? The Royal Navy used to be 20 years and out, but they're no longer that. And the reason is because, A, you can do a lot to upgrade the ship inside. You can do a lot to make sure to give it new electronics, new engines, all these things. So as long as the hull's good, you can keep going. There haven't been really that many revolutions in hull design. I'm fairly sure we've got one coming. But be without there being a major naval war to push things, no one's going to really push into it until they need to. For example, it's a tumble-down hull, and it's the performance options it offers. Um, yes, they were got rid of a long time ago, but they're now coming back, and they're very, very good fitting with modern systems. If you look at what's happened to the Zumwalt class, and the French have got it, it's another reason why I do not believe the Type 45 will be replaced by a Type 26 and type or Type 31 modified and modified ship. It will be a new tumble-down hull design because Britain will be the only navy without them at that point. Um, so this is what's going on. But it's going to take its time. It's peacetime, and it's there's been peace for a long time. Basically, if you want to compare our period to anything, we're sort of... Oh, how do I put this... Post-Cold War at the moment scenario, we've got some land wars going on, but nothing really major at sea, nothing really major driving technological innovation. So we're sort of the 1820s to 1860s, 70s, really, because you've got the ironclad sort of coming, but the ironclad aren't really that massive a change on themselves at sea. Um, I think with the decline of people playing cards along the current climate, the, ter the term Trump has begun has begun to lose its connection to uh, Ukraine. Um, possibly. Ah, I'm sorry. I was ah number one RF or two Scots in you speaks. Mm. See you, mate. USA sub chasers were very slick in World War One. Later, many became run runners. Maybe not as much, not as much, but very useful for that. Well, glad they, they helped. Hmm. Jeff Peter, I read an RCN torpedo squadron in the Adriatic. It re-equipped itself with 40 million bofos that fell off a truck. Is that in the books? Yes, that is mentioned in there. Um, lots of things fall off the back of trucks in wartime. They really do. It's amazing. Roger, I have the original printing of both Allied Coastal Forces. I wonder if there's any difference in new printings. Um... I have some of the. I have an original printing for the next one, so I will see when I can see the when I get the next the new printing of the volume three, which I heard is coming. Um, then I will compare it because I think that's the one I have for that as well, and then I will tell you. But I don't have the first two. Calvin Gasman, on air shows, stealth craft, even regular fighters carry radar prisms. Yes, it's like when warships and submarines are operating normally, they are they carry noisemakers which make them noisier than they actually are. It's only when they're doing something operational that they turn them off. Hmm. 
Hmm. Um, a supersonic Harrier, Nighthound Productions, there was actually a supersonic Harrier type looked at. It wasn't a Harrier per se, but it was looked at. It just wasn't developed because at the time there wasn't the argument for it. If there had been, if basically if Britain had been planning on keeping more car uh, building carriers of the size of Hermes rather than the Invincibles, you probably would have seen the P154, I think it was, built and developed. But as it was, they didn't. So it was the Harriers were adapted. And really, they come of age with a C Harrier Mark II. Hmm. Username. Actually, the li late Pedron era is kind of like our current one in the series that sense that no one really has fresh naval war experience versus peers. Mm, to an extent, yes. But the thing was, I was looking for a period which was even longer. That had sort of things going on. And the Battle of Toshima. Um, Stuff Thompson, Dr. Clark. In your opinion, what is the smallest class of ship that would benefit from the greatest from the tumble home hull? Um, probably also will the X-Bow become the standard for supply ships or the turtle? Uh, back bow. I would say tumble down. You could pretty much any ship which is designed to require to go fast could benefit from a tumble down hull. Um, so pretty much frigates and above. Maybe OPVs, depending on what you want them for. But probably you'd go for the cheaper hull structure for an OPV. And I wouldn't be surprised if you get some very, very interesting X-Bow hulls and all these things of various ships would come up. But I'm not quite sure whether it will come in for all supply ships because, again, if you're just building commercial tankers and commercial ships, it's going to determine what the commercial designs have gone away. And that's what basically they are. They're adaption of the commercial designs. Hmm. Asanam, F-105 was so thin on the fr uh, thin front on that in order for airfield radar to properly detect it, they needed to include a, a reflector. Basically, the FUD was unintentionally stealthy, but only for friendly radar. Hmm. That wouldn't surprise me. Right then, um, what Max books do we have? Oh, this one. Fleet Air Arm Handbook by 1939 to 1945 by David Ragg. Um, this is not a new to me book. This is another one of the fill-ins. And it's just a cool book. It has the damage to Illustrious, caught off Malta. Which, of course... The very lovely uh, Jamie would be really, really interested in. Having spent a lot of time with him talking about Formidable today. Uh, well, not yet today, yesterday. Um, that was fun. We, by the way, this is the announcement. There is a video going to be coming shortly from me and Jamie talking about HMS Formidable and basically going into her history and her operations near Crete. We did it. We recorded yesterday. Jamie's doing something. So it's the same thing as our, um, our Operation C video. Which we did, but it's, a, it's looking at Formidable and Crete. And we're probably going to expand it into a bit of a series. So it would come out at some point. It's We were talking for a good two and a half, three hours. So it could be a very, very long video. Um, but I think you guys will enjoy it. Um, and it will be, I'll put it up and I'll put in sections and all those sort of things. And it won't have advertising because it'll be both me and Jamie chatting. Um, yeah, it's fun. So, this has got plans in of, in this case, of HMS Illustrious. It's got all sorts of things in it. It's a really lovely book, and I don't think it's that much money. Um, 
I really don't think. And it's got all sorts of little details in it about the naval ratings and badges. And I love the leading photographer badge. That's one of my favorite badges. You know, I think how long has it been since they've been using cameras like that in 1940s? And yet that's the badge they go with for a leading photographer. Hmm. <laughs> I believe the USN is currently going through an age of indecision. LCS, Cat, Ford, Flight Free Burke cancelled. Uh, Flight Free Burke has been cancelled. That was something I had that hadn't cropped up in my radar. Let me check that. No. As far as I can see, the flight free Burks have not been cancelled. The question is whether or not the uh, flight two, uh, flight ones and twos, are going to be actually upgraded. But um, yeah. Flight 2As are still being procured, and the Flight 3s have begun. There's been a Flight 2A technology insertion included. Good Lord. Yeah. Seriously, the Burks have a lot. There are a lot of them have been built. 82 uh, planned 82 as of July 2018. Currently active 67, seven building and free on order. Whew. Yowza. I still prefer the Zumwalt class. But what they're going to end up building instead of their uh, instead of them as a successor to the uh, the Burks, who knows? Mm-hmm. Uh, Daniel Phillips, if the RN had switched fully to 24-inch torpedoes in the 20s, what effect would this have had on World War II and specifically on the Tribals? Uh, not much of an effect. The Tribals probably would have still had their their the torpedoes they did carry. Um, they'd have been designed for it, you know. It's not that much bigger. I think, honestly, I'm trying to remember the Tribal torpedo, in, uh, the tribal torpedo diameters. I think the Tribals had fairly big ones. Memory's just gone completely blank. The Tribals are fitted with 21-inch torpedoes, so let's be honest, the 24 is bigger, but it's not that much, it's not so much bigger, it's going to create a lot of hassle to change the design to a 24-inch. So, yeah. They would have been, they'd have accommodated them. Let's see, lots of questions coming through. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. That one and a uh, uh, considerant. Dr. Clark publishes to pay you for promoting your books. Not much better price for there are for a nice demographic. Hmm. Well, to be honest, I enjoy reading the books, so I don't really want. I, I prefer. I'm happy not to have payment. I'm happy to have the books. Although if they insist on paying me, I wouldn't say no. But I would then expect them to not mind if I tell them the book was terrible. 
because occasionally I will tell you the book's terrible. If the book's, I don't like the book, I'll say. Um, Alison Hammond. Okay, yeah, fun photo experiment. You're in charge of procurement and fleet design for moderate size na nation near the Pacific. Your government has allocated the sum total of 15 billion uh, Great British pounds to build a navy. Um, I'm probably going to focus on cruisers and submarines and destroyers. Destroyers for escort royal cruisers and maybe some aircraft carriers and the fleet air arm, but you know. Depends what I want to do with a navy. Probably be getting a few extended armoured carriers, i.e. more indefatigable class, indomitable, uh, than um, illustrious. So, sort of, slightly longer. Still got the armour. But um, have um, two flight decks, uh, two hangars and a uh, single flight deck sort of scenario. Still have the gun armament they had and all these things in the building they have. So they're, you know, nice and strong aircraft carriers, but, you know, have more aircraft. That's probably what I'm building. If I'm building a navy from scratch, am I going to invest in battleships if I'm facing on the Pacific and I've only got 15 billion pounds? Depends, again, what yards I've got. It actually depends on how much armor plate I can produce and procure. Because the thing is, battleships require a lot, lot more very high-quality armor than aircraft carriers, cruisers, destroyers, and submarines. And so I can spend money on those and build far more ships, or I can be very limited in my terms of my armor procurement, and I can, you know, be a, a very small number of battleships. So that's the thing. That's the, the big limit, actually, more than money. Kevin, I'm not sure we are in a great peace. Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, China, India, Iran. I think more world proxy war, possible. By that, what I meant was that there is wars going on ashore on land, but there's not much happening at sea. And that actually makes it more difficult for navies to get funding for trying new stuff because no one's worrying about the sea. And in many ways, that was the problem in the Cold War because the big fight was going to be in Europe. It was going to be in Germany. It was going to be there. Uh, it was going to be all sort of over there. And you've got a scenario going on where, frankly, actually the navies are over here. They've got a supplier thing. They've got to, but it becomes very much considered a secondary theatre to the primary theatre. And it's it's rather interesting. It's the what I call because of the Normandy campaign, all those sort of scenarios, the North Africa campaign, reading of history of the World War Two. You've got the Battle of Britain, all these things. The Battle of the Atlantic is always, to an extent, forgotten in comparison. And so that's why when they're planning for the Cold War, they keep forgetting the Battle Atlantic. And then there's also the easy write-off, oh, it's going to go nuclear very quickly. And it's only later in the Cold War when they start to go, hang on, it might not go nuclear that quickly because both sides, neither side really wants the consequences of a nuclear war. So, okay, we have this problem. Uh, Bernard, arguments for and against the USN get a Queen Elizabeth class Catabar? Four, it allows them to get po possibly the eight and eight, so it can manage to get them the numbers they need to. The against probably would stop nuclear carrier build because it'd be so much cheaper. Then, Freeman, I think the cancel program for Alibergs is the attempt to give them an electric drive, um, electric engines or some sort of hybrid. Uh, there are all sorts of issues. Technology inserted, flight 2A technology inserted, I think is what's been, being discussed. And that had more built into the program and they've now cancelled those and converted them to flight freeze because they're happy with the flight free design. Because what happened was they ordered the flight freeze, then they ordered some flight 2A's, T uh, flight 2A TIs more to, uh, just in case the flight freeze didn't hold up and now they're happy with the flight freeze they're cancelling the two the ta uh, the flight to taia's uh atis and they're uh, building flight. basically in nicest way the americans just should just name these new classes honestly they should just call them new classes just to make my life easier purely and simply um let me just the thing up let's see da -da 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 -da. Really, instead of calling them all this sort of uh, these weird names, what they should be known as is we should be able to talk about the Mahan class, uh, the Thomas Hunter class, and the Jack H. Lucas class. 
If that was easier, then I could be talking about it and it would make sense. But as it is, I'm talking about early book, Flight 2A, Flight 3, Flight 2A, TIs. Oy. Just trying to confuse an old boy. Mm -hmm. So, Thompson, Doctor, have they updated that badge for best photography uh, for best photography to a to an eight millimeter yet? I doubt it. Austin Hammond, what do you build if you have to build a, from no navy to a working one? Start up by building up from the classes. So start off by building smaller ships, getting the people out to sea, getting them experienced, then build up the sort of the bigger ships, then build up the bigger ships after that. And, you know, work your way up sizes. Don't start with something massive. You'll crash it. Start with smaller ones. Hmm. Uh, Abbas, I see. A rumor stuck that the USN will be commissioning first fall LCS, and wishful thinking started to get them uh, get them for the Polish Navy. No, no, no. That's not wishful thinking. That's pain for the Polish Navy. No. Polish Navy can get so much better for their money. No. No. Hmm. Doctor, do you think if Norway and Crete would di went different, do you think the war in Europe would have been much shorter? Yes. If the British had... Let, let's put it this way. If the British had caught the German amphibious forces at sea in Norway, taken them out at sea, which honestly they had enough force out there they could have done, and then managed to win on Norway, uh, land enough troops to mop up whatever existing German forces managed to make it to land, so Norwegians being prepared for them, so they put up a stiffer resistance... German Navy knocked out, probably some British troops land to back up the Norwegians, so Norway ends up entering the war on the Allied side, very, very pro-Allied. Iron ore supplies from Sweden very dramatically dry up for the Germans. Um, and you have Crete, if it doesn't get lost, you then have a scenario where the uh, in the nicest way, the British don't lose control of the Eastern Mediterranean, don't have the issues they have in the Eastern Mediterranean, because probably they don't lose the ships they do. And the no uh, the Germans aren't getting into North Atlantic. And you could probably have a scenario where the British would be laying a line of hydrophones from Scotland to Norway and back again, a couple lines of them, and just having sub-hunters patrolling there and just going, yeah, you want to send a submarine here? We'll hear it coming and we'll be on it before you can uh, before you can say anything. Which would have also made it very different from the, you know, you think about it, the Arctic convoys. If you don't, if the Germans don't have Norway, then they have no chance of getting their fight, their aircraft up to attack the Arctic convoys because there'll be air defense fighters in Norway to fight them off. There'll be radars, etc., in Norway to fight them off. Their submarines are, would have to get through that whole barrage, mines, everything across the North Sea from the UK to Norway. It would just, just not be a good scenario for the Germans. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Luck, you should sign up for Amazon Associates where you could get a cut for links to books that are followed from books sold. I have never really heard about that, but um, if someone sends me a link, I'll sign up to it. Uh, seem like, boy, I never realized India was, has nuclear subs. China I know about, so I guess I should know. Wonder, is Pakistan working on one? Scary. Uh, no, uh, I don't think Pakistan is working on nuclear subs. Don't know who, the more I read about Journey World War II and the logistics, the more surprised I am they got as far as they did. Basically, they, like the Japanese, managed to get a lot of places by dealing by managing to jump people and surprise them. Uh, they basically, they had a better, quicker OODA loop. Um, than the others at the beginning of the war. 
because the others were trying to avoid war um, because they weren't ready, but the Germans weren't somewhere about. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you for my thoughts. Bert was a good man, but come on. Yeah, it, it is getting a bit weird with the Bert class. They do, it seems to be the class they don't want to die. Um, Line of reduction. The XF52 5U development of Flapjack had an X and takeoff landing speed for Hmm. Probably. But you know, they didn't. Uh, the XF-52 development project had an expected takeoff landing speed of 40 miles and top speed of 415 knots. Seems to have been promising design for a prop start of Stovall aircraft. Would it have been worth looking into design as the basis of a modern day prop of a Stovall aircraft? Possibly, but they never did look in it, so that's a lot of money to develop. And would have been sensible. This France fault. The Germans were focused on using pre-existing infrastructure. Very good at that, but were up the creek when having to operate outside of that. Yep. Uh, Daniel Freeman, that's I think the issue with renaming the Arlie Burks would be Congress might start looking at the spending too much. Probably. They're just signing off on building more Burks. That's it's what they know. So expect a Flight 4 Burke, which will have a tumble-down hull. And all electric power, and probably have rail guns because probably by the time they start the flight, four books they'll have the rail gun and sorted out. <clears throat> okay, da -da 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 -da. I think I've caught up. Jeff Wheeler, what does dire mean in the UK? Term not used much in UK, Canada. Bad. Very, very bad. Right then. Samsung's Dust Clark, Visby Corvette for Poland. Now that will be good. That'd be so good. Visby's would be cool for Poland. For Poland, they make a lot of sense. Carl Gansman, re Norway. On the other hand, if half of the historically dud German troops, uh, torps, actually worked. Yes, that would have been a problem. But if the British had come... It's going to sound strange. The British task force, if it had been further south rather than north where it was, uh, thinking that they were going for the North Atlantic rather than thinking they were going for Norway and had run into them, my goodness me, the Germans would have been in trouble. Daniel Phillips. Uh, what would have happened if Sean Austin and Eisenhower were sunk along with Glorious? Lucky hits or swordfish launch in time. How would this have affected German air strategy put going forward? It would have made a very big difference, probably to their stra uh, to their strategy. It would have um, they might have scored a kill, but they'd have lost their only two real surface raiders and two real surface ships. So, uh, yeah, Hitler's already skeptical attitude towards uh, large surface ships would have probably surfaced with a vengeance. So you have probably not seen the battleships finished off, which would have changed again the war as far as the British were concerned. Then, could an Arleigh Burke have the command bits expanded to CVSG Air Defense Command role that the CG seem to be used for? They, they could. If you design them for it, you could. You could extend the hull. You could do all sorts of things to call it a Flight 4 Arleigh Burke. That's why you make it a tumble-down hull, because you go, look, we're taking all the Arleigh Burke spits, but we're putting in a slightly new designed hull because it's more efficient and going to give us more force. The fact it's a bit longer, has a bit more space, yeah, it's still a Flight 4 Burke. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Ooh. Back in a second, I've got still four more books and a whole lot of iron brew to go. But back in a second.
my gum. Whee! Whee! Yeah. Ooh, hello. Right then. Uh, da -da 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 -da. An, Bitron, an alternative Norway campaign sounds like good old history novel. Perhaps the series? Norway, Crete, Singapore? <sighs> yeah, it's basically those are the classic cases of terrible. Um, Donald Freeman, Dr. Clark, uh, Flight 5 Burks have warp engines, Class X phases, and photon torpedoes? Well, if the US Navy keeps building them, yeah. Um, Chairman. Um, Ben, no, what would a new class, cru a new cruiser class look like for the Iron News if properly funded and had political will behind? Um, you'd be probably talking 18 to 20,000 tons, you'd be talking rail guns because probably by the time they got funded in the service, they'd actually be working, um, or some sort of advanced gun system. Uh, depending on which was more sensible. You'd be talking a load of VLS, a large number of helicopters, and... a lot of command and control facilities. They'd be very big, powerful ships. They'd definitely be heavy presence. And actually, there is a scenario I'm sort of looking at where they might actually be sensible for the British, and they might actually be built. They could also be at that size, possibly it potentially be nuclear powered, which might not be sensible for the Brits because it asks us more questions about why the Queen Elizabeth weren't. But um, possible. Um, Vision, what are the key advantages of tumble down hull, and should it be uh, be with a clipper bow or ramo? Uh, basically, it's the stability profile it creates for the water and the stealth profile it creates for the ship. So that's the thing. If you can, it, it, a tumble down hull, when built right and built into the right hull, creates a far more cleaner cutting through the waves. So instead of it doing and pushing the bowels in this sort of world. You see the bow wave and these sort of effects of the water going out, and that's a lot of friction it's hitting because it's cutting through the waves at sort of this angle and pushing them down. This sort of pushes them all or lost, so it gets slightly more less resistant going through the water, and it makes it slightly faster and more efficient. Requires less energy to go the same speed, basically. Poland has all sorts of issues, but in the nicest way, there are allies, and they are dealing with the big threat from Russia, so um, you can sort of allow them some issues internally. Just the day of the uh, Dread Pirate books, I take my hat off to the young fellow's bladder capacity. Pretty amazing. Thank you! Um, I, 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 it, it, it's actually more difficult to contain it probably sitting down, and it will be walking around the room. Um, but there is a reason I send to disappear about 8.30, because usually someone calls me and then I take advantage of them calling me about that time. Because they usually check, call him to check in about what time I think I'm going to do in dog walk this evening. And um, so I usually I'll send and use that as an opportunity to um, wander quickly. Um, Jemek, I would look on the French-Italian projects. Maybe Frem, maybe something smaller. Uh, uh para and, and shiny US toys. Uh, I would say, if I was looking, I'd be looking at the bulls. Then you would like frigates, the French building. They are cool. And you could adapt those to the Baltic, because they wouldn't need to be as long a range. So you could use more of the space for weaponry. And all sorts of things. What I love, I have one of my best friends is actually currently calling me on my phone, and they know I'm live on those things. So, you know. That's going to happen there. Ah, 
I actually sent them a link to this, so they should be watching this. Ooh. Stafford Thompson, uh, don't clock. A double down hull would negate a clip out. A ram would be more possible, but just because you have a ram doesn't mean you escape damage. Yeah, uh, it's, it's preferable not to do the ramming, honestly, in modern ship designs, unless you're building something which is basically an icebreaker. Wait till you hear this week's bilge pumps next when it comes out on Wednesday. Woohoo! Hmm. Look into Convene for uninterrupted lecturing or YouTube casting. Tempting. Um, usually what I just go is go to press bye-bye, or I'll call you later. Give a Congratulations on having your book published. I saw your book on the Seaport catalog. Welcome aboard. It is rather nice. It's rather, rather nice. I'm rather happy about it. Uh, it does make things a lot more fun. Answer on speakerphone. I would not be that cruel to her. Uh, it's actually, it's one of my friends, and she's got, a, she's having a sort of bit of a, a, she is a girl with many sisters and many best friends, and we've known each other for years. I was her mentor at um, university, where, and, well, I was in my first year, actually, she was in her final year, but I only discovered she had dyslexia in her final year of university. And so I was asked to be her mentor to help with her dyslexia. So because I was used to my dyslexia by that point. So I went, yeah, fine, I'll mentor her. Mentor her. And um, we've been friends ever since. And she's getting married. So I've been made to stop there being a fight between all her various girlfriends and all her you know, sisters over who would have the honor because there was already a fight over it. I have been given the title Man of Honor. Which is um, causing me some fun and issues, but so far has mainly involved with me discussing menu options for the wedding. So um, that's been rather nice, as frankly, I have managed to uh, advise on food options, which I like. And I have to give a speech, and I'm quite good at those. <sighs> mm hmm. Sure, Mac. I wait. I just realized that what the US is doing the books is what they did during the Age of Sail, where they would build a new ship, but a piece of the old ship in and say it was a repair. Eh, to an extent, yeah. But I keep calling them Burks, they don't get into a fight over them. Um, Jeff Beeler, lots of what ifs in Norway 1940. HS Glowing was total happenstance, but that triggered a series of events. Yeah. HMS Renown, charging down. Sean Horst and guys are now going, um, you know what? Uh, you're pissed off. You've lost one of your destroyers. Um, yes, we outnumber you, but we want to be over there because you are, you're pissed off, HMS Renown, and, um, we really don't want to be here. So, um, yeah, bye bye. <laughs> Renown going, come here. You killed my destroyer. Revenge will be mine. I want your blood. You know, Renown was really annoyed at the Battle of North Cape when it came out because, you know, the Duke of York got her kill. Mm. How real a danger do you think the navies are considered expensive and unnecessary, politically speaking? For those that know navies are important, but politicians are less informed. There is always an issue. There is always an issue with that. Um, it's just annoying. I was asking, latest example, four ASW ASR helic choppers, the most expensive helicopter with the most expensive configuration. They're good enough, but there is not enough of them to serve role. We need four plus four. Hmm. Potentially. Strub, Doctor, I saw an article about adapting semi submersible vessels similar to narco subs for resupply isolated areas. What are your thoughts? I think it's a very viable sort of option. In fact, actually, again, listen to Bilge Pumps. Listen to Bilge Pumps this week's episode because we do narco subs. We do all those things in this week's episode when it comes out on Wednesday. Mm hmm. Dr. 
Dr. Scott, now I can't wait for Tuesday. Little hint, please. Um, it The Bill Trumps comes out on Wednesday. Uh, my time. Which it might be Tuesday your time, but it's Wednesday my time when it comes out. And Tuesday we are recording. Tuesday we are recording the, uh, we are recording the next episode of Bill Trumps. And of course, Tuesday also is going to be de -de 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 -de, me live with in the evening. Remembering which one. I've recorded both the introductions. Well, I've recorded drafts of the introductions. Whether they actually remain the introductions are a completely different matter. They might well be re-recorded tomorrow. At least one of them is looking. I'm looking at re-recording Tuesday's ones, I think, because I'm think, you know, thinking what it is. Because Tuesday's is going to be... Da -da -da -da. Uh, yeah, the submarine ones, and I am looking at re-recording it, because now I've read that book for a second time, um, I am tempted to re-record it and add some different things into it. Pretty much. So, um, right then. This is another reason why I'm looking at re-recording Tuesday's book. Is this book. Modern Naval Strategy by Admiral Sir Reginald Bacon and E.F.E. McMurphy. Looks rather old, doesn't it? It is very, very old. It is published in 1940. Command, it's got titles including War, Peace Strategy, Command of the Sea, War Strategy, Air Attack, Amphibious Warfare, Convoys, Mediterranean, Pacific, Psychology and its Effect on Strategy. Uh, postscript of Obic Dicta. It's got various maps. And its preface and forewords are written by Reginald Bacon. It is a beautiful old book. It has got some maps in here. Let me go through some so I can show them to you. Page, well, it's got several battle tactic maps. And it's really a lovely snapshot in time of, well, in this case, of some of the battles which took place in the First World War, some of the stuff which happened in the Second World War. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous book, and it's got so much detail in it. And because of Bacon's role in the Royal Navy in the interwar years and everything else, this is a really interesting snapshot into Royal Navy thinking in 1940. Now, I would say in the nicest way, Bacon belongs to one faction, so not everything really accords with the full Royal Navy. But it is, if you fancy it, if you fancy a hunt to find it, because I have a feeling it's not going to be easy to find, you will find it a most interesting book. Especially if you want some analysis of World War One doctrine, World War One experience, and some analysis of what the war's going on, and it has some absolutely beautiful plans in there. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous book, but it's you know 1940. Ben Lara, what made a good central battery ironclad? Nothing made a good central battery ironclad. Elspray 20. Any tips for people with dyslexia? Um, planning. Plan the stuff before you do it and plan your writing before you do it. Try and get it organized before you start writing it. That's the main thing. I It's kind of an interesting story with my friend. She was very, very bright. She managed to discover dyslexia to basically cover it till she was 20 odd years old. And um, yeah, that's not a fun age to go. I, mine was found out at 11. I was basically one week I had a headmaster telling me off in front of everyone for um, not being because I was able to talk quite well. And because I was able to work things out when I was talking to people, he was basically telling me off for being lazy in front of everyone for um, not doing my writing properly and therefore being lazy when it came to my writing. And the next week when the report came through, uh, he was apologizing in front of everyone. Although that was a headmaster I had a lot of fun with. He was actually a very, very nice guy, but he was a very strict gentleman in certain respects. And he was good in many ways. And that was sort of less great. It was a different time, let's say. 
but he was good with it, and I, I still remember the time when I had to stand up in assembly and correct him because he got my birthday wrong. Well, actually, technically, he hadn't got my birthday wrong. My mum had given him the wrong birthday for me because I was supposed to come on one day and I came on the other day. And um, <clears throat> she told him it was one day, so he said to everyone, "Ah, oh, no, it's happy birthday to Alex on this day." And I went, "Excuse me, sir, it's not my birthday. My birthday's tomorrow." And ends up calling my mum, and it got found out. And yeah, so I wasn't told off for correcting my headmaster in front of us, in front of everyone else at the school assembly, but I wasn't wished happy birthday ever again at school assembly. I am not wearing a dress, no, Jay Richardson. I am wearing a suit. Osprey twenty eight. So variety of barbecue for the food. Actually, I was trying to get. I, I, I'm making a case for beef Wellington. Stuff Thompson, look like that. May have been a 911 call. Quick a quick text, make sure she's okay then. Uh, the the wedding is actually not for about two years. So, yeah, I think we're fine at the moment. If it is a 911 call, we've got a problem. My project, I got it through in my... If I got it through. It, my new missus helped me out. I volunteered vintage. Oh. Then, would the Germans have engaged if Renown had been escorting Loris? Probably not. If Renan and Glorious had been together, A, aircraft would have been airborne, and B, Renan would have gone, Hello, my pretties! Come to me, my pretties! You're my, you're my dinner! You killed one of my destroyers earlier. It just wouldn't have been pretty for them. Um, Joe Sousa, China's just saw an AG-600 flying boat made in flight today. Rude tweeted at you. Thank you! And yes, they are having fun. It's got on, they're making a big thing about it, and everyone knows it's the South China Sea. Denfim, Denfim, can't tell. The Admiral in command of the Germans was fired after that, so we don't know how he would have responded to the threat, but doctrine would be to run. Yeah. He was fired because he got damaged, basically, and the ship was damaged. Success is great. Getting damaged? No. Jeff, did that make the renown the biggest tribal? Handle with care. Pfft, to an extent, yes. Warspite, arguably, is slightly bigger tribal. But, you know, both of them definitely have vengeance is my um, middle name. Mm-hmm. Osprey 28. How much is the interest? Um, I'm not sure. Oh, this book. Um, I picked up this copy in my little bookstore, which I go to down in Tavistock. And it's, this book was originally belonged to a lady called L Lindsay Elizabeth Yoxall, and who has kept it very nicely. And I picked it up for the sum total of £10. But I'm fairly sure it's not that book norm and that, that price normally. And it's Modern Naval Strategy by Admiral Sir Reginald Bacon and F.E. McCurt Mercury. It's all the details of the books are down below in the description. Paul Johnson, Amazon has it for £6.74. That would be good. Um, yeah, probably. Steph Thompson, uh, Dove's Clark, your headmaster could see the potential and didn't want you to squander it. Ah, yeah, he's a good guy. Second one, it is only recently the medical profession that, um, he was coming. Uh, it's not so much dyslexic, it's also autistic, which has been the big problem for girls. I know a little girl who does have autism. Um, she's my, uh, sister's best friend's daughter. And she's amazing. She wants to be an astronaut. And honestly, any chance I get, I do try and help her and encourage her because she's going to be spectacular. And, you know, it's quite it's quite fun. My sister sort of um, she the, the, her mum is friends also with my mum as well as my sister. So they counter things. And often I get how about it? I've developed a habit 
when I'm at big family gatherings and there's a lot of little kids, I end up being the one looking after little kids because I let the mums have a break and I am basically a big kid. So I will go take care of little kids and entertain them and, you know, do all sorts of funny things, you know, pull funny faces and that stuff, read them books, that stuff, because it gives the mums and dads a break. And frankly, for me, it's a no different than normally looking after students, honestly. The fact that probably little kids are slightly easier to manage. Not wearing a dress? You can. It's not. I'm not wearing a dress, not because the nicest way I couldn't, if I needed to, pull one off. It's more because I've got better calves than my um, friend has. So I don't want to show her up on a wedding day by wearing a dress and just looking better in it than, you know, uh, looking better from, uh, you know, from the leg down her. So it's better if they, my calves are hidden nicely in trousers. It keeps, it, it, it stops, you know, problems. You should never outshine the bride on the wedding day. <sighs> mm hmm Jessica, I worry your question will get lost in the chat and be hard to see. Battalion of Infantry versus Battleships. Hard to tell us. Depends on what for. Basically, it does depend on what for. Uh, the scenario is, if you're fighting in land, Battalions of Infantry are quite cool. If you were in the Goose Green scenario and had a Battalion of Infantry versus a Battleship at that close range, the Battleship would probably win. To be honest, Gloria should have been with the main fleet. She shouldn't have been running off on her own, but, you know. Then who? There appeared to be two old soldiers then degenerating into one of the two ways uh, such an acronym I've never heard of, which is better than at least every other word for being a naughty one. There is a lot of discussion going on about Scots and the Royal Tank Regiment and all these things going on. I'm finding it pretty cool, but I am trying to not get distracted too much because it is quite cool. Um, our local uh, Jeff Beard, our local reserve unit is run by its master corporals. Most of the Royal Navy reserve units are run by its killicks, uh, which are sort of the Royal Navy equivalent of a corporal. Mm. I have worn a kilt several times in my life as well. <laughs> Terence Lanka, Doctor, are you going to get around to reviewing Admiral Danny, Daniel Ebaldi's MacArthur's Amphibious Navy Seven? Um, I will though. I haven't got that book in here at the moment, but today's ones, carrying on with them, are the two brassies because I talked about them last week in the top trumps, but I don't think I gave them enough billing. Honestly, I don't because this is the reprinted one. Remember the nineteen twenty three one, and. When I say I don't give it, I didn't give it enough billing. I, you know, it's got all these sort of ship drawings in. It's got, it's sort of. I, I feel if I had just put in the top Trump ones, it looks like, you know, all the ship designs, the armors, these sort of things. And I feel like I am just putting it down as one of the fun books. And really, it is a very serious book, and it's got serious content in, and some seriously cool pictures. Uh, this particular one that I just showed is the design for experimental battleship, which is also an aircraft carrier. Being looked at in 1923. So, people tell us that, you know, the battleship and the aircraft carrier... Well, you know, the aircraft carrier wasn't understood. It wasn't going to be that great till World War II. And they, well, until then, it was all battleship admirals. They didn't know what they were talking about. Well, they're designing a battleship carrier at one point in 1923. So that would suggest they are really actually looking at it. And there's a lot more pictures and look for a sort of advanced ships, which are potentials. And it's just, it's just cool. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, I think... That's one of the C class, Cape Town class, light cruisers. They are beautiful, beautiful books. And the one I really didn't give enough time to is this 1949 actual brassies I've got here. Got a few of these, but you know. Let me just uh, catch up the questions quickly. 
Daniel Freeman, I thought most military units were run by the NCO cadres. Officers are mostly decorative. And the officers are for one thing, NCOs are for another. Officers are for command, NCOs are for leadership. And usually technical experience. Osprey 20, I hate to destroy books, but I've given several of my rare books to digitalized projects that uh, way other people can read them, even if they are out of print. That's cool of you. Scopy Africans, I just read First Drinkwater Unburst. Flawed, much in subordination by a junior lieutenant, implied a hum. Yeah, there's a lot of fun things in that, in the Drinkwater Omnibus. It is a really, it is a dirty, it, it is a sort of, it's a far less clean portrayal of the Navy of the period, and I find it far slightly more realistic because of it. Mm -hmm. So, this is the real deal, okay? This is the 1949 edition, and it includes the new Russian battleship. It includes the USS America, the forecast 65,000 ton supercarrier which was designed to get them into the nuclear bomber options. It includes my book margin saw these lovely pictures of Des Moines class and some British carriers. The British naval base in Grand Harbor, Malta. Yeah. Includes my bookmark with just some a piece of paper which just fell out. Uh, it is really, really well written. It is really interesting. It's got LSTs. It's got all sorts of things in it. And it is, well, I'm just going to give up with that. The pictorial section. You know, and it just carries on. It is absolutely beautiful i do enjoy them and i know several of you have been actually looking up and buying more or buying some brassies um but i just wanted to put them out again because i do think the brassies are beautiful and the fact is they are slowly disappearing because james is still going brassies as i understand it isn't and that's a real shame I could be wrong on that brassy thing because I have heard some rumors that they're not, they are still going, but you know. Jeff Beeler, Simsec has given me insight into the role of RN observers on aircraft, especially Wessex SWs. Yeah, they did a lot of stuff on those. So, Doctor, you explained there a reversal in Norway. What is an example of one battle in the Pacific that would have shortened the war? Well, in the nicest way, if the U.S. Navy had known Pearl Harbor was coming before it happened and had managed to have its carrier and battle squadrons deployed at sea, so when the Japanese launched their attack on Pearl Harbor, A, they found all the fighters and bombers already airborne and waiting for them, and the bombers could come out to attack the carriers, but they had the carrier group and the battleships all storming towards the, bomber, the carrier, the Kido Batai, that would have shortened the war very quickly. Because if you had the Japanese fleet wiped out in December 1941, there is just no coming back from that. Oh, did it, did it. Mm. Joseph Clare, the Germans before World War I had a choice of building battleships or fitting more Italians. They didn't have an unlimited amount of money. That is the problem. And they're fighting a land battle. Go for the battle, a land battle. Uh, the. Um, Battalions. See what I collected all the Lord of the Rings sets and gave, gave out to brothers English class kids till he retired recently. Same for my June sets. Tired of teachers ignoring classics. Mm, agreed. Just all, skip you, Afghanistan. 
Yeah, basically, it, yeah, it's one of those things which is ignored if they can do. Jeff Beeler, the Pacific War was... Uh, sorry, that's discussing uh, Scipio Africanus and is talking about homosexuality in the Napoleonic War era. And honestly, it was ignored if it could be. If it didn't cause any problems, it was ignored. But that book confront, confronts it. It confronts the fact that in some cases it doesn't cause problems. And that uh, sort of period, but in others it doesn't. You've got a huge concentration of men wandering around the world. You know, odds are. Mon Dorothy, Dr. Lock, bought Brassies 49 the other day and just brought our in China station on eBay for £22. Oh, cool. Disfrance, uh, thank you. However, would a superior officer ignore the comment? If they could ignore the comment. If they could. If it was done in a scenario where they couldn't, they wouldn't, and they would deal with it. But often when you've got... The trouble is, if you've got some making malicious comments and you rise to it, you incentivize them. What can you do? Can you kill him for making... Can you have him executed for making a comment? No. Can you have him reprimanded? Yes. But then you have to get the captain involved and it causes trouble. So in that scenario, it's just easier to ignore it because it's not going to... It's in the same thing. It's a balance of what's the be the best scenario for this. As Tisfransport says, it would depend on the inclination office of the officer. I think there was a oh there was one admiral in the Napoleonic period who actually wrote uh, when he was uh, had a response for uh, a mess email from a chaplain or some sort of English um, bishop asking about his views on the subject said I do not care what happens in the privacy of my men's homes or it doesn't in, as long as it, anything does not disrupt the rule of command on my ships all I care about is that. And I think that was the philosophy of quite a lot of officers in that period. Maybe not the ones who are loudly speaking, always are making pronouncements, because they're making loud pronouncements, but never believe. There is always a good, great thing, great term, the silent majority. And honestly, sometimes the silent majority, the reason they're silent is they just don't want to bother dealing with the loud, the loud mouths. They just want to ignore them and get on with their jobs. Uh, to France, well, the Japanese have called off attack if they attacked and if the attack noticed the ships weren't in Pearl Harbor. They'd probably tried to, but the trouble is, by the time they'd have seen it, they'd have been committed. Then, everyone, honestly, I don't know enough about the era to know how acceptable such things were. Things were discipline was not always uh, so strict in th on things we might care about. Honestly, this uh, you have to remember: a captain on a man of war in this period is God. Within the limits of his ship, he is God, and if he wants to choose to enforce the rules or not, it's up to him. It's on his chain of command. And the same with the officers below; they lesser down of basically the archangels down. And I said, they have a lot of power; they can decide. They can decide what's a problem to them. Back in a second. I've got two more books and a lot more iron brew to go.
Ding, dun, 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 dun. E by gum. Um, <clears throat> that's awesome. that's awesome. So when did the days of a good jab to the solar plexus become as a disciplinary round end? Um, there are lots of random punishments available, but there's also examples where officers had their entire careers completely destroyed because they took punishments too far. Um, you know, there's an, uh, when, um, there's an example where a midshipman decided to discipline a sailor by smacking him on the head because they wanted to kill the sailor, pretty much. And they were completely stripped of everything and removed from the service. And pretty much, it was, yes, in a nice way, you are allowed to hit them, but the fact is he hit them wrong and it caused problems. So there are limits and there are... <clears throat> It depends a lot on the captain in charge, what they actually get to force. There are captains who very famously go through their entire careers without ever having to flog a sailor. And they are some of the, some of the most senior, some of the most, uh, some of the most historically important and discussed captains went through their entire careers without ever meeting out any of those punishments which we hear so much about. You know, the uh, it, it's basically it's a case of they are to they are there, but the reason the part of the reason they're talked about so much is because they are rare. So when they happen, they're big deals. Sorry, Doctor, what if Japan failed to take the Philippines? Would it be a major to fall in the Japan side? It would have really caused them a lot of problems. Um, it would allow the Allies to keep far close. It's kind of like if Singapore doesn't fall. If you Singapore and the Philippines don't fall, then Japan has a lot of trouble. They basically lose at the South China Sea, and they've got a heart. They've lost all their strategic depth. Trent Lincoln, Doctor, did Okinawa's screen commander, captain, and later vice admiral Frederick Mooseberger leave any oral history of his time in Okinawa? I found bi uh, little bits. Uh, there is some little bits, but I'm not sure much. Uh, where is my best book for that? It's around here somewhere. Um, hmm. Nope. I did a review a couple of weeks ago, I think, of a carrier aviation book from the Pacific War. And if it's in anything, it will be in that. So if you go back a couple of, I think, two or three, possibly, um, brew ships, you'll find it in that. Ah, there it is. This one. Carrier warfare in the Pacific. Um, if it's in anything, it'll be in this. Mooseburger. No, it's not in here. But there is a lot about that in here, so I would say probably start with this and it'll probably lead you to it. So that's um, Carrier Warfare in the Pacific by the Smithsonian. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I'll see if I can track down something about me smoker. I have some friends who might be able to help. So, one last book for this week. Fraser of North Cape by Richard Humble. Now, I have a small problem with this book. 
And it mainly starts off with, I like Fraser and I like the work, but this is an example of what happens post Second World War. This book is written in 1980. It was supremely fitting that his, match and ta this, that his matchless talents as a gunnery expert earned such a unique reward, designing and putting into production the Royal Navy's last generation of battleships, then using the we that weapon of his own forging to fight and win the Navy's last battleship action. Okay, that's written by Admiral Leach, who should have known better, because in the nicest way, Whilst Fraser was the director of naval ordnance in the in the early mid sort of nineteen thirties, nineteen thirty three to thirty six, um, he's not the director of naval construction. That's a guy called Reginald Henderson. So Henderson is the one who's design is in charge of designing the carry uh, the battleships, the King George V class, and these sort of things. And really, Chatfield is pushing them. At most, you can possibly put the guns and the turrets of the forty uh, of the um, King George V's down to Fraser, but honestly, I'm not sure I'd be proud of that quarter, that um, quadruple 14 inch turret design myself if I was him. But it is actually a very good book and it's worth a read. And it has this beautiful picture at the front which shows the um, uh, the Shan horse getting lit up by illumination and it goes through all the things and all the stuff he gets into. It even has some pictures. It's it's a worthwhile read, and it really is nice. I just have problems with um, Leech's foreword, mainly because I find Leech. I, I, I am not the biggest fan of Leech in my in, in any times, and I have to say, you know, mm. definitely a good book though. Fraser and North Cape. Oh, I'm not sure why that's suddenly turning blue in reaction to that on the on the screen. Oh, blue. Where the well, the blue lights are on, so I suppose that's where they're coming from. But you know, there's the blue. Mhm. Mm There is so much RN approaches looking at a broader view. There are some fun historical podcasts out there which purely concern sex as a subject. Uh, yes, there's been history hacks have done quite uh, done a couple of them as well. Um, Sir Thompson, looks like thanks to the enlightenment. Uh, question: Was the Hudson Bay Company just East India Company, East India Company 2.0? Pretty much. Uh, just front of all, Lord Byron is fairly famous, uh, up, famously up for anyone. He complained about school friends pretending to not be their true selves. Hmm. Yes, he was famously up for anything with a. No, I didn't even have to have a pulse. Strub, Doctor, we know Americans British conducted forced landings. Did Japan ever conduct a landing on a major fortified beach? I think it is Wake Island, as Bitron says, but I think they did a couple of also ones which are sort of uh, more limited operations in the Philippines and various other camp parts of their campaigns on defended beaches. They weren't as defended as you were facing at Normandy, but they were fairly defended. How impact would it have been for the USN and all navies if the Panama Canal didn't exist? Uh, it would have made the problem of supplying the Pacific very, very much greater. Although you'd probably ended up with the US Navy thinking about it. Probably if they'd lost the major fleet at Hawaii, the Pacific fleet would have fallen back on San Francisco, as they did anyway, defending it. And the major fleet units to get out there, they'd have a choice but I would go down around South America. And, or possibly they'd have gone round Africa from the Atlantic fleet that would come from, would have come down the coast of Africa and through the Indian Ocean and joined up with the British at Force Z. So you might have ended up with by the time Force Z gets sunk, they might well have been joined by several American ships. So you might have had a whole different scenario with Force Z. Um, that's interesting. That's something else which me and Jamie discuss about what would happen if Formidable hadn't been damaged at Crete. Thank you, Dr. So and all. I really appreciate the elimination of this issue. There's assumption about, and now, now I'm reconsidering my thinking about this issue. Um, yeah, it's 
you have to remember, yes, there are examples of persecution. There are, certainly. And there are examples of some very horrendous punishments being carried out. But the trouble is, uh, when I'm looking at it, there is no organization which is so much dependent upon who happens to be in charge than the Navy in that period, who what the captain sets the tone of the ship. And the captain, and this actually goes into the modern period as well. Um, there are many conversations, there's many interesting things which example of um, discussions of Bletchley Park, which of course was actually run for quite a while by a naval officer. And many of the very great academics, etc., who were recruited, including. Um, Oh, I forget his name. The really, really good one who actually came up with the computer and all these sort of things. Uh, oh, my brain's gone there. Ben, uh, ben that Cumberbatch played, played him in a movie. Oh, God, brain is dying on me. Anyway, um, there's all sorts of things about how he would have had to cover his sexuality. Honestly, if an naval officer in charge, the odds are no. Because naval officer would have gone, as long as it doesn't happen in front of me, I don't know about it. And anyone brings it to me, I'd go, where's your proof? Oh, it's suspicion. That's not proof. And again, there's a, that's another thing a naval officer can hide behind. Because a naval officer can go, well, the articles of war, the penalties that we have are so great. You have to be on, prove beyond reasonable doubt before I can enforce any of them. And if your only proof is suspicion and rumor, that is not proof. That is suspicion and rumor. That is stuff. Yeah, hearsay. I cannot. I'm not going to rule on hearsay elements. Captains could find all sorts of reasons for getting round things if they wanted to, and it's the thing is if you want Turing, turning, uh, yeah, Turing, and Turing. Uh, thank you. So that was the gentleman, and it's interesting. The real persecution of him and his sexuality comes after the Second World War, after he's outside of the protection of the Royal Navy. When it's during the Second World War and he's under the protection of the Royal Navy through the Bletchley Park project and all these things, it's all. It's once you get into the sort of more uh, very post Second World War, you get a bit of a puritanical streak comes in quite heavily. That's when you get some of the problems. And. Basically, the Royal Navy's policy is always, as long as it doesn't disrupt the command chain, we, we can ignore pretty much anything. But the moment it disrupts the command chain, so you have a very decisive justice system, which goes, below this threshold, we can ignore it. Above this threshold, it's gone. Martin Doherty, Dr. Clark, uh, what do you think of the new craft for Gibraltar? I would still prefer a couple of modern Fairmars. I would have preferred them to be in slightly bigger and armed with a 40mm on the front rather than machine guns, but I can understand what they've gone for. But I, I can understand and I can understand the reasoning. I like high speed. I like them being 40 knots. I like them being man maneuverable. I think slightly bigger would not have been too much a problem. And I think if you're putting the 40 millimeter on the Type 31s, buying a few more and sticking them, a couple more and sticking them on the front of them so they have a 40 millimeter forward and a couple machine guns out would have been perfectly fine and given you a lot more potency for dealing with the Spanish. Just transfer, British police were the ones who are more conservative, through, is, uh, mm, potentially. Excellent. That's a fancy microphone setup. Yeah, this is what Paul from Chicago sent me. It's pretty cool. He sent it to me via DRAC mail. So it got sent to a DRAC and then get it sent to me. And I use it. I can do this. So when I'm doing late night recordings and I don't want to um, keep my family awake, I, I pull it really close. And when I'm just being me talking to all of you and can be my normal loud self, it goes a bit further away to make it easier on your ears. And the final book of today. Because I've seen these have gone down in price recently, and I've been talking about it on Amazon, 
Uh, the Transactions of the Institutional Naval Architecture, 1939. Really cool books. Really cool stuff, full of interesting details. This one has a paper written about HMS Ark Royal by Sir Stanley Goodall himself. The paper is the sequel to that on aircraft carriers read by Sir Arthur Johns in 1934. Ark Royal was designed to a standard space of 22,000 tons. And it is beautiful plans of HMS Ark Royal. So, the thing is... This also, of course, famously contains the obituary for um, Richard uh, Admiral Reginald Henderson. And I saw one recently on Amazon, I think it's gone already, for only £30 in what was in good quality. Um, if you can get hold of them, they are pretty darn lovely. Transactions and Institutional Architects. There are all sorts of them. They are published for many, many years. Some books have more detail and more things in them than others, but they are going cheaper at the moment. And well, I, I think it's quite beautiful and it's got some really cool stuff. So, if you're interested in naval engineering and you're really interested in getting the details on these ships and some of the stuff discovered, go and have a look at them. Have a look at what they've got in there. If you're a bit of an engineering history nut, you will love these but these the transactions and you'll love the discussions of them and they are just they are full of social history engineering history cultural history everything included in these books but as i said i've seen them recently going cheaper and i thought well i'll put it in again Uh, Thompson, Doug Clark was under the impression that the puritanic nature was due to the loss of men population need to regain tax based citizenry from before the war. Uh, potentially. Hmm. Strub, Doctor, the USN in Hawaii sorted for storm avoidance. Does the RM ever have to sort for weather? Yes, it does. Occasionally. In history, it has done. Um, it's rare in the channel ports. That's one of the reasons why the Royal Navy is mainly based down in the channel. Um, they mostly have managed to protect some really good anchorages, but uh, Scarpa flow occasionally. They have to do all sorts of things because of weather. I had a big argument with someone who rejected that history by its nature tends to be subjective and open to interpretation, but they insist that history can be a subjective science. What's your opinion? Well, dates of things can often be objective, although even though some of them are open to a question, interpretation, depending on your sources. And honestly, history is an imperfect subjective science because... As I was saying at the beginning of this, if you have, uh, Drac has put it, and I've put it, Nina, you'll have one perspective from someone in the front of the ship and one perspective from someone in the back of the ship. They're both right, but it's their own opinions of what's going on in the battle. So if you only have the source from the person in front of the picture of the ship telling you what it is, you get the impression that that's what happened, but that might not, that's not a complete picture. There are so many people involved in events and so many things. Actually, the details can be very difficult sometimes to work and pin down. So you can, might have a very objective history on a 
large scale, but once you filter down, it becomes very, 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 very subjective. And it's what sources do you have? How do you interpret those sources? In terms of what's their reliability, what's their perspective, what's their bias? All these things can factor in. So I always say history is something you can draw lessons from. But be careful about treating it as the absolute truth. Because I could be proved wrong. You know, we all said, uh, uh, when we're we going through this, um, sometimes I will say things which are my reading and others will come back with things going, no, 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 it's this and this because we've read this book. And, well, I could be wrong. They could be wrong. We don't know. I can go, I'll go read those books and I'll see what they'll say and I'll compare it to what I've read and I'll figure it out. But the thing is, we might both be right because I might be drawing my information from one set of sources. They're drawing their information from another set of sources. And actually, the reality is somewhere in between those sources, but you won't know until you put those sources together. This is the reality of the history of history we're talking about. And this is the thing. what are, What's doing what and where it's going is often subjective. So I would say I get worried when people try and teach treat history as a science, for starters. I get worried when people treat international relations as a science. I, this is why I like history to be included as an art. It's a, I, Technically, it's a humanities, and I prefer that as a title of anything. You can try and use the scientific method, but if you think about it, what is the scientific method you can use in, for history? Even when you're saying, oh, we're going to use a big data approach analysis to history, you go, well, where's the data come from? What's the data? What's the analysis? Where does it come from? What? How are you drawing in all this data? Where is it all coming from? Are those? Is the source of the data subjective? Is it a lot of? Just because you have a lot of it doesn't actually iron out that subjectivity, because again, you say, "All right, I have got drawn this data from three hundred diarists." Well, then you've got an interesting thing because you've already got the diarists are by their nature are going to be people who like to write, who can write, who can read, and whose diaries are of good enough quality and actually remain and survive that you can use for this. Well, that takes it down to quite a small population sample, and you're picking from one particular group. So that can give you one particular view. Or I'm going to draw it from all newspaper articles. Well, again, newspapers, even in our time, we admit how subjective they are, because it's the perspective of the person giving the speech, and it's also a mirror, uh, it's filtered through the perspective of the person writing it, the person editing it, and the purpose of publishing it. These things are all subjective. So, you know. So you might, uh, when they release us from the lockdown, you need, an, uh, you need an author's lecture. I would travel to such event. Short lecture, signings, and direct books. My civil war group had them. Um, actually, there was always the, the plan originally that when my book was launched, I was going to do a book launch party, and it's still technically on the books, at King's College London, in one of the Lawton series of lectures. So that could still happen, theoretically, if, it, if we keep on lockdown. Vision. I have trouble remembering names of actors. For some reason, to think up Henry Fonda, I had to think of Jane Fonda first. I know a name of person to talk to point I need to say. Yeah. Vision. To remember a guy, Jim Partner's name, I had to think that the first of the Spirit of St. Louis, which was built by the Curtis Aircraft Company, his name being Curtis. That is actually quite a good system. I usually just start to keep talking to people until they tell me not on it. Same was I had a question. Worst case scenario is that all land ice melts over the next two years and sea level rise six, six meters. How the heck do you plan for something like that? Uh, you start building a lot of seawalls. <laughs> you can't really. You just deal with it when it happens, and as it happens, and hope it happens slowly. At least slow enough that you can pour a lot of concrete. Jeff here, recap. Kido Batai lost me uh, lost means Japanese don't take wake. Maybe you're a bull. Can't take East Indians, no coral seal me But the Eastern still have to retake bases. Probably. But honestly, if you lose the Kido Batai, the, the Japanese fleet aren't gonna be doing much. I don't know if they lose all the Congos as well. So they'd lose the Kido Batai and all the Congos.
So there's no comment. What I take issue with in the drink one another is how does he not remark on the comment? And the, there seems to me insubordination to the first lieutenant's face. Was this realistic? Yes. First lieutenant again would often ignore it. And if it's in public and if it's a scenario, then he could deal with it. But if it's just ignore it. And then honestly, if the first lieutenant needs to start reacting to someone being provocative, then he's lost a lot of authority. Basically, you treat the person like well, you're a child. Bugger off. Excuse the French. Constantinus, for history, in theory, so long as you back up your work evidence, they will respect your work. Though politics sometimes messes this up. True. JP Lee, USN was planning for climate change until orders to stop. I think they probably still are, but they've just changed the title of the program. Sure, Mac. This is a video. Uh, this is a video on two six two kill claims. You can see how first hand sources can contradict, ma contradict massively, and then how you can interpret it. Hmm. Excellent. So we require time machines for making careful observations. Yes, but if I have a time machine, I warn you, I'm going back to nineteen thirty three, and I'm going to have a long chat with Admiral Henderson, and you're going to find the Royal Navy ends up going into war with a a lot more forty millimeter oricons in their various fire plant positions. B, um, they're going to have the 4.5-inch guns in everything. There are going to be double turrets in the tribals. There are going to be double turrets in the Cs, the Ds, all those cruisers, Es. Everything's going to have 4.5s upgraded. And, um, yeah, there's going to be a lot more aircraft carriers because I will have persuaded them to double their orders. And... Most importantly, the kit, I will go and personally hold a gun to Chatfield's head until he gives the, filter, the King George V class free treble 15-inch guns, turrets. So they have treble 15s in all of them. So they're basically, you know, or he can, or he can go treble 16s. If he wants to go from the Nelson and Rodney fit, he can do. And they can have treble 16, for, uh, two treble 16 forwards and one treble 16 aft. That's fine by me. I don't mind, but they are not going to have 14 inches. I think it would depend on the officer and the context. Not all officers are aggressive or feel comfortable with discipline or challenges. If everyone is perfect, no drama. Hmm. Okay, additionally, say goodbye to every coral reef. It won't kill them off. Well, it will kill them off, but it will move them. In the nicest way, what this happens is the coral reefs will will move up to shallower water slowly. 40 millimeter bofors or 20 millimeter orlicons? Um, 40 millimeter bofors and 20 millimeter orlicons are lots of them. Sorry, I was combining the two, wasn't I? Do apologize for that. Jeff Biela, Kido Bataille only had two Congos and two CAs plus one CL and DDs. The rest of the Japanese Navy doing a few support in East Indies. Battle line intact. Yeah, but that's a big loss. And if the US Navy hasn't lost anything, then they're in trouble. Danny Freeman, going back to 93 feet, also have a word with Daniel Hamilton about doing more, a bit more PT, less pies. It's not the PT and the pies which kill him. It's the 18-hour days for six years. So, honestly, what I would go back in time to is basically go, right, then you need a deputy, and that's going to be me for the next six years. You are going to have bedtime. You are not doing more than 12-hour days.
Mandarin, Lion, BBSS, and Sea Hurricanes. Um, I, yeah, I'd also probably do something. Actually, in the nicest way, the Full Mars would probably get a working. Because then I think the Full Mars, if you give them uh, an, a slightly higher rated Merlin, got them in service earlier, and you'd get, also put a Merlin engine in, the, in a um, swordfish design, and give them 20mm cannon, 20mm uh, cannon instead of machine guns, they would have been a freaking lethal aircraft. So I'd probably upgraded the full Mars to the point at uh, the point that they were going into combat with two 20 millimeter uh, with 20 millimeter cannon to a pair of them in each wing and a pair of machine guns in each wing so instead of them having eight Brownings they'd have two 20 millimeter cannon and two hispano cannon and basically two uh, and two machine guns in each wing And yes, the hangers would be slightly wider. I'm not sure about offset hangers, but um, slightly taller hangers possibly, and offset elevators, I would make the elevators bigger. Uh, offsetting them might make them... Uh, it depends on how you armor the... Ca if you're doing an armored hanger carrier, you could probably still do that with... Uh, a f you could stretch the armor out the full length, and you could uh, it would have it on the side. Y you could do it, but it would be interesting to make the armor still work. Daniel Freeman, also go back a bit further and allow BT to have an accident to say the battle. I'm not so as invested in the J Battle of Jutland as Drac is. I have a feeling Drac would go back and deal with the Mark 14 torpedo debacle. 1933 prep for Max and Bill Many Talk. I escort carriers would definitely be being built earlier on. Sir Thompson, if the crown coins, uh, no, six inches. I would also got, in a nicest way, I'd have got rid of the Dido 5.25s. More possibly. Uh, I'd have well, actually probably kept them. They'd be useful for their Dido's, but I'd have more town, uh, more town class built with six inches before World War II began. Jerison, you have a choice between 40mm Bofors or 20mm Oricons. What do you choose and why? 40mm Bofors. And why? Because it packs more punch. And it's going to almost the same rate of fire, but it packs more punch and longer range. And it's about right for the radar systems they have available. I know, puppy. Don't worry. I'm almost finished the brew. I've almost finished it. Sorry. There is a wolf coming from downstairs going, it's walkies time, papa. Skipping on from that uh, kind of that is why I consider history an art and a form of literature. And sympathetic to Herodice over Thucydides. Yeah, as I said, I like it in the humanities. I like it being in its own sort of thing. Not don't consider it an art, don't consider it I like humanities as a phrase because it means it's the human studies. Next Asia, thank you for me. The Ironman putting out plans for ships 15, 15 inch 50 cal with J3 design. So, the seem to want more. They did. Thank you for me. Uh, get the Merlin a Miss Schelling, Schelling's orifice. I'll tell them to make the damn things injection rather than carburetor. Uh, yeah, something, definitely. We could upgrade the Merlin a bit better. Trent Lenko. Kita Batai on 7th December 1941 would take a lot of killing. However, ready to fleet an army at Hawaii we thought it was. It would do, but if they were caught with their aircraft trying to attack Pearl Harbor into the fighters of the army, whilst the bombers of the army and the, uh, and the attack aircraft of the Cat and Navy's carriers were attacking them at sea and managed to take out the carriers and then the battleships engaged, well... There wouldn't be much keto batai left.
Carmel Gasmund, wing mounted. They, I know they weren't reliable by the time of the full Mars, but if I'm back there in 1933 and I have six years, I have six years to make those Hispano cannons reliable. So that's six years of me sitting on top of the design is going, you will fix this problem. Maybe not thumping them, but, you know, possibly just lighting a small fire behind them. If Kida Batai defeated, does he send Dash for the Philippines? Probably. After rearming. More town class and sloops. Oh, yeah, a lot more sloops would also be ordered. Jeff Vila, one minute to go. Huh? Jerison, can Raleigh tell the time? My Josephine can tell by the church bells. Uh, Raleigh just goes, it's time. Not sure how he knows, but he knows the time. He knows when he I walk him in the afternoon normally and when I walk him in the evening normally. Gone Eagle, what's the point of the Bowfighter when you got the Mozzie or vice versa? They have different, slightly different roles. The Bowfighter is a slightly heavier aircraft and it's more for... It is used as a long-range fighter in many cases. The Mozzie is used more as a light bomber. But basically, they are complementary. Hmm. Yeah, Roger Keyes would have also been deployed to the Far East as Supreme Commander, if necessary. Right. Don't remember, don't go, Mozzie's brand new light fast bomber und using underutilized resource, bow fighter development incrementally from the bow foot bomber. Yeah, to an extent. But also, the bow fighter is pretty darn cool. Um, Daniel Freeman, would you shoot the Blackburn bow for design team? Possibly not. Right then. So, I'm going to say thank you to everyone. I'm going to say thank you to all my Super Chats. Thank you to all my subscribers. Thank you to all my Discord supporters. Thank you to everyone who's pre-ordered my book. All the links to everything is down below, including the letter for Drac and Jamie. And thank you, everyone. And hope you've had a good evening. Hope you've enjoyed the brew ships. Number 12, I'm going to start this week putting up all the episodes, logging them in, and set, scheduling the lives for August. So they're going to be all scheduled on the system. And thank you. And I'll now deal with the last couple of questions. Uh, I'll spray to Ray. My question is, how do you convince them that you know what you're talking about? I'll bring history books with me. The entire Norman Freeman collection. And besides, if I've got a time machine, I will grab them, put them in the time machine, bring them to the future... Show them what happened in the future and then take them back. Basically, one visit to central London in the modern day will tell them it's, it's the future. Take care, everyone. Thank you. And it'll be a lot of fun, a uh, trip to the past. Anyway. Take care. Win the lottery first, then show them the history books. They didn't have a lottery in that period, but I would, you know, probably. You know, anyway, take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Almost forgot. Uh, take care. Thank you. Night night to Angus Sassonel, Stephen White, Paul Johnson, Stephanie Wilson, Bichon, Carlin Gasberg, Jay Lingworth, Brock Payne, and Sean Mack. Brock Payne, that is a very cool book. And basically, take care. Thank you, Kevin Mataggart. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Martin Doherty. Thank you, Stafford. Thank you, everyone who stayed the whole time. Golden Eagle, um, King George V, all of you. I hope you have a lovely evening. And Adam Crow, thank you. I haven't seen you comment before. Thank you. And Stephen White. So thank you, everyone. Take care.